ஸோ ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிக்கலாம்ல ஓகே ஸோ ஓகே ஸோ குட் மார்னிங் டு ஹால் ஸோ ஐ எம் சிவானந்தம் ஸோ திஸ் வாஸ் மை ஃபர்ஸ்ட் அட்டெம்ட் இன் யூபிஎஸ்சி சிவில் சர்வீசஸ் எக்ஸாம் அண்ட் ஐ காட் அன் ஆல் இண்டியா ரேங்க் ஆஃப் எயிட்டி செவன் ஸோ விச் யூ மைட் ஆல்ரெடி நோ பிகாஸ் ஐ எம் தி சேம் அகாடமி ஐ ஸ்டடி டியர் இன் ஆஃபீஸஸ் ஐ வாஸ் இன் தி ஆகஸ்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி பேட்ச் Uh, so in today's class we'll be looking at the first chapter of ethics that is ethics and human interface so that is what we'll be discussing i'm hoping to explain you how i did my notes what are the points i have and how to use it across all questions you don't need special notes for all chapters ethics is something where you have a set of 50 to let's let's keep it at 50 to 75 points you will be repeating these 75 points across all questions that is how we will get a score of 100 in ethics the highest in ethics this year is 136 or if you give me a moment i can check the highest is 136 the average score of anyone in the merit list is 100 to 110 the lower scores or the scores that has brought down some people's rank or the scores of people who have not come into the merit list is around 80 to 90 so this is the range at which your ethics marks will spread out it's the same for the other papers which i will discuss maybe once we complete half the class then i will explain you how mains itself is and uh, how these marks spread over across papers because at the end of the day irrespective of all knowledge and everything what you really need in this exam is to score a certain number of marks in mains and then score 170 in interview so that you come in the merit list and that is what we'll be aiming for in this ethics class so myself and uh, the other two toppers uh, madan at uh, uh, rank 19 195 and uh, Chatriya at rank uh, 244 will be taking this class. Uh, we are hoping to have 12 sessions. Today is my session. The next session is on 22nd. And the remaining schedule, I will ask admin to pass to you by Monday. Because I have to clarify on a certain syllabus and what, like how to present some topics to you. Once that is confirmed and I have the concurrence of the other uh, topics, then we will give you the schedule by Monday. Hopefully, the classes will go till uh, maybe July 10th. so it won't be uh, there will be hopefully there will be no more classes after july 10th or worst case we will have till july 15th not more than that okay so first i'll show you my mark sheet so that is necessary so this is my mark sheet so if you see here my uh, so people at the last can you see the screen can you see the marks you want okay it's fine is this visible now okay done so if you look at my marks uh, i want you to first focus on personality test so that is 205 the highest mark this year is 206 i scored 205 and this is where or uh, interview is the stage where uh, it pushed my rank to top 100 so right now forget that personality test right now fix it at 170 because for anyone who is going to do the personality test i would say the mark you should minimum aim for is 170 so it is based on that that we will determine our main strategy it's very important getting 170 in interview is 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 like it's a majority score of everyone in the merit list and in the non recommended list it is very necessary for you to go through the mark sheets of people who did not pass because only then you will understand the score gap between people in the merit list and people who go to the interview and not get into the merit list is very low is extremely low because there are so many capable candidates who miss it by a few marks so that way personality test and the total just uh, from 205 fix your mind at 170 with that we will now talk of the uh, mains uh, scores itself so ethics my score is 117 the highest this year is around 140 so 140 is your topper or the highest mark in essay the average mark that everyone has got this year is 100 to 120 so this is like i want you to focus on this average mark i'm telling you if you come in the range of this average mark of 100 to 120 for essay and for the other papers 100% you will pass mains and go to interview and it is necessary for you to focus on getting this average mark first so people who are the who are first attempt uh, people writing mains or if you will write mains in the future i want you to clearly put in your mind that you need to first focus on getting this 120 there are enough strategies in the internet that will talk to you about scoring that 140 but right now i'm telling you forget about the 140 it's fine if i if we get 120 get the 120 like even in your uh, even if you are sleep if you come and write an exam if we can score 120 then we will focus on the extra 20 marks that extra 20 marks is only for getting a rank in top 50 
if you want to rank from top 50 to the last of the merit list, according to the statistics we have, you do not need that extra 20 marks. You need the average marks that I am talking about. So, SA right now fix it at 100 to 120, right. Uh, then for general studies paper 1 uh, to paper 4, the, uh, the highest mark is around 125 to 135. Uh, so, my scores you can relate it to the 125, 135 range. So, I am always lagging behind the highest score in the paper by 20 marks. The only paper where I scored the highest mark or close to the highest mark is optional. Optional paper 1 sociology 152 is in the highest mark range. I believe 153 is the highest, but I am not very sure. There could be people above me, but scoring 150 in optional is the score is, is, the, is the highest scores for most of the optionals because you are if you cross 300 in optionals that is a big thing and this year if you are scoring 270 plus in optional that itself is a topper level score and if you score 250 that is the average score we are talking about so that way if you see essay and optional essay optional 1 optional 2 you should be aiming for 125 per paper so that should get you 375 so in optional you have to score 250 and SA it is 125. So, this is fixed. If you do not get this 375 marks in SA and both the optionals, then you are not in the game. It is either this or you do exceedingly well in general studies. All your time is consumed in studying the vast volumes of general studies. You also know the amount of syllabus that is there to cover in general studies is high. Optional is bounded. There is a limited syllabus. You make notes out of it then you are not studying anything out of syllabus or it is not like anything that that is under the sun would be asked in the exam. Optional is limited which you can complete in 3-4 months. Essay is your writing skill. It is like till 12th standard if you have done your English essays properly, then essay is not a problem. Essay is, essay is not a big thing. Your knowledge comes from GS 1 to 4 and your writing skill comes from your English that you have studied till 12th standard. Because the problem that people face in essay is they cannot write 1000 words together there has to be a logical flow and concurrence, so, coherence sorry, logical flow and coherence. Maintaining this across uh, essay of 1000 to 1200 words is where the difficulty is because you will write points, your first point will not talk to the second point, then it is not an essay, it is a general studies answer. So, that is where people are losing marks. Instead of 117 if you score say 100, the 20 mark gap is because your, your essay did not have a logical flow. 1000 words must keep talking to the same topic and there has to be continuity in the in the way you are presenting your answer. So, that is where this 100 to 120 difference will come in essay. And then the general studies paper you have to focus on getting 400 cumulatively. So, every year general studies one of the papers will be spiked or there, there will be a hike in the marks. 2019 it was ethics, 2019 ethics highest mark was 160 something. Because that year ethics was, was was given that buffer that let everyone score high. The average mark in ethics in 2019 was 120. So, anyone in the merit list, even the last rank is around those 600 to 700 range, also were having 120 in ethics. So, it will happen in GS every year. So, this year, this year no spike like that happened. So, GS 1 and 2 has top score around uh, 120 to 130. GS 3 has a top score of 109, I guess, and that person did not clear uh, did not come in the merit list. The highest score was with a candidate who was no, there in the non recommended list of uh, people. He scored the highest mark in GS 3 uh, and GS 4 the highest is 140. It is 136 to 140 I am not clear of the final value. So, if you look at that range and look at my score. So, you understand that I am always having a deficit of 20 to 30 marks with respect to what is the highest you can score in that paper and I am still there in the merit list. Why did that happen? So, means if you see the general cutoff this year was 745, my score is 783. If you go by the strategy that I am telling you, SA both optionals score 125 each, you get 375. Four general studies put together you should aim for 400 because the general studies topper, the cumulative topper for general studies is already rank 1 I guess and her score is somewhere around 530 or something. I am asking you to aim 400, there is a buffer of 130 you can skip. So, you do that, you still get a mark of 775, 400 plus 375, it is 775. The general cutoff for mains, clearing mains is 745. You still cross general cutoff and you have a buffer of 30 marks. You understand this? Th this is your mains game plan. If this is like the bare minimum game plan, I am not telling this strategy will make you all India rank 1 because this strategy will not make you all India rank 1, but your name will come in the merit list. 
that is what we are aiming for. So that way that 775 is the magic number you should aim for in mains. Anything you score above 775 is, is like bonus, treat it as bonus. If you get it, your, your rank is going to come in top 100 or top 50 or anything, wherever it pushes you. If it does not come, your name is still there in the merit list and that is what we want. At the bare minimum, we want that, right. So this is what you should look at and your, so for this, the easiest way is focus on your optionals first because the syllabus is bounded, it is like your semester papers. In colleges, whatever theory papers you have written, there was a book, you, re you read that book, you went and started writing something in the exam hall. Your university professors corrected it and gave you some marks. It is very similar to that is what is optional. Just that the syllabus is new, most of you would not have studied your optional as your graduation subject. So treat it like that and study, then it is not a big deal. You like All that fancy advices you get, all that uh, bonus advices that you get to get that 1 mark, 2 marks extra to make that 150 is fine. Listen to all of that. If you can incorporate, incorporate. But make sure the staple content is ready so that you get 125. Even if heaven falls, you should get that 125. If things go your way, make it 150. Just like this 152 in my optional, I did not think that I will score this much. My aim on both the papers were 125. It's just that things worked out in the exam hall and somehow the examiner evaluator gave me the 25 marks extra. And that 25 marks extra helped me adjust the deficit I was getting in GS 124. Because GS 124, my total is not 400. If you put my total, it is 204, 284, 292, uh, 380 to 389. So there is a deficit of 11 marks. So that deficit and the deficit in SA, I told focus on 125. So that is a deficit of another 8 marks. So uh, 11 plus 8 is what? 19. So 19 mark deficit got adjusted in uh, the sociology paper 1. If this 19 mark, if it was not getting adjusted in sociology paper 1, then my score was a little less. Personality test gave me a boost. So my rank would still be in the range of 100 to 200, preferably in the lower ends of uh, 100. So maybe 180, 200 to 210, somewhere around that place I would have got a rank. It is just because that sociology thing worked for me, this, this in my strategy, whatever failure I had, I just adjusted it with sociology mark and it got me into top 100. So this is how you should see. So every topper will have a story like this. So their story would be in a different way. Mine story is, is how I looked at this thing this way. So in GS 1 to 4, all your vast syllabus is for GS 1 to 3. Irrespective of how much you study, the maximum mark you are going to score there is 360. Let us keep it at 120 per paper, you are going to score 360. So if you feel that GS is too tough or too vast, aim for 300 in those 3 papers, give up on the 60. This is a conscious decision so that you give up on the 60, you minimize the pressure that is on your head for mains and focus on what is easy to score marks. So you aim for the 300 in GS 1 to 3, get the 300, focus on the other areas. So the other areas you can score, if you put some effort, you can improve by 5-6 marks easily. Improving from 100 to 120 in GS 1 to 3 is where the whole, uh, the all the pressure and stress and vast syllabus and everything is there for those three papers only. For other papers, you do not have uh, much syllabus. Is anyone having any issues with this strategy? If you have any cross questions to ask, please ask. Because if you can get this in your mind, you, you will have a variation of this strategy that will be personalized for you. So if anyone has a question, you ask this first. After this, we will go to our classes. So then I will assume that you have no questions. So if you have any questions, we will we'll see. You will keep seeing me for another, uh, for all the classes. Myself and the other toppers would be coming to take the classes. Uh, so yeah, if, if not now, you can ask me later also. So this is there. And right now, don't think on personality uh, test. That's because uh, once your mains get over, there is enough time for you to take like 10, 15 mock tests, sorry, uh, mock interviews. And that is enough preparation for you to uh, get through the interview stage. Interview stage by far is the easiest stage. As long as you do not go do something controversial or make some blunder or uh, have one rebel kind of personality, like everyone is wrong, only I am right. As long as you do not have such extreme personalities, uh, the time that you have after writing mains is more than enough to score 170 in interview. From 170, pushing it to 185 is reasonably possible based on how you present yourself and everything. Anything above 185, according to me, is a bonus. Anything above 190 is a bonus. If maybe I go to the interview again, I am confident of scoring 190, 
but I don't think I can 100% tell you guys that uh, I will score 205 because that last that, that last 15 marks of bonus that any topper gets, uh, we also do not know if we can replicate the same success the next year. So that is why I am asking you to focus on what the topper got, reduce it by 20-25 marks. Now that mark is the average, that is something that all of us can replicate. That bonus is something uh, like you can you can call it anything, uh, maybe some toppers can replicate, replicate but I am not confident that I will get 205 again, maybe I will get 190. But that 15 mark extra is something, it is like your, the day has to be yours and things have to go your way, they, the, the panel should not ask questions that you do not know, that you have no clue about. So there is a lot of variables to factor in, so you forget that 15 marks, maybe focus on 190. But the average that I aimed for an interview was 170 and that is necessary. You score 775 in mains, 170 in interview, your total score is 945. 945 will put you uh, like for the reserved ca uh, categories OBC, SC, ST, it is a very good score. If you are in general, there is an additional task of getting a spike in one paper. By spike, I am telling like sociology paper for me. You get the 775, then get your 20 mark extra in any of the one papers or get the 20 mark extra in personality test. So that way your score becomes 965 or something and 965 will push you I guess in 200 to 250. So this is how it differs. The mark difference between uh, different categories is 30 marks, general to OBC and the other uh, categories. So that 30 mark difference we have to adjust somewhere. So that is also possible because you can make a spike in one of the papers. So which means you do not have to focus on all the papers, choose one paper and see that if you can get the 10, 15 marks extra. Preferably do it in optionals because any other paper also will fail at the last moment but optional is something that you can strongly hold on to. The marks are almost static now, static now. Uh, there will be a variation till 2018, 300 was a good score and people were scoring 350, kind of uh, 320, 325, 336 was the topper scores. Now it has been normalized and brought down, so now 306 is where the toppers are there, 270 plus is seen as the, uh, as a very good score, 250 is seen as average. So this variation is there across years. What we want is in that year, we want to be in the average mark or slightly above average mark. So that way every, so year to year calculation needs to be uh, adjusted for uh, how this normalization works. Do not get misled by uh, a score of 330 in say 2014. That 2014 score when it translates to 2022 should be maybe only 306. Because every year the way they correct and the normalization works is different. We, we have no clue how that is happens. So this is how you should do. So this is for mains and interview and I told you you will still come in the merit list. Any spike that you make in any of these papers will push you into top ranks. Understood, right? So yeah, we will see some of my mock papers also in the uh, session now, but before that we will go to our class. So I have been told that you have been given some source material to study from in the last class. So please stick on to that material, that itself is way too much material to score say 100 to 110 in ethics. So this is the book I bought for preparation. The book is very new, so that like I am showing it to you because I did not use the book, <laughs> you only read the headings. If you want, if any of you want to check the book, you can come and check the book also. This is lexicon, uh, I bought this because like when I started preparing this is what I found in the internet saying lexicon is a book, good book to read so I read. So in, in some sense this book is also not needed if you have uh, Deepak sir's notes. Deepak sir's class notes are really good for uh, ethics. You can use that as base then add some value points from this class and that much is enough for ethics to score say 110 to 115, One hundred, keep it at 100 to 115 because the way you write also matters in that range of 15 marks so that we will see. So the first chapter in ethics which we will see today is the ethics and human interface. So one important thing in mains is that you should somehow mug the syllabus. The words in the syllabus should be in your head. Those words will act as pointers for you to generate points on spot. You cannot be mugging all points, it is just not practically possible. If I ask you to write something, you have to connect it to the syllabus, get a word from the syllabus 
you would have studied something for that word that will come up in your mind it will be stored somewhere so the the syllabus word you connect with the question then whatever you studied will come in some form that is what you write you don't mug and write so if you keep it that way your preparation is going to be a little bit simple and i'm telling you you will fill papers you will fill enough papers for the exam <laughs> another point you need to think is you have to write for 52 pages so maybe for a 150 word question write 125 to 130 words you can't you can't write 4000 words in 3 hours you you are like physically it's very difficult some of you will write i know but most of us can't write i was not able to write so i may have written 3500 words per paper i consciously ensure that i'm writing 100 to 125 words for a 150 mark question and i was writing 200 to 225 words for a 15 or 20 mark question in ethics it's a 20 mark question so you have to maintain this because otherwise you will not have time to think you will be randomly filling pages with english the keywords will be missing the mark is for the keyword okay so that way today's topic we have essence determinants and consequences of ethics dimensions of ethics ethics in private and public life human values lessons from great leaders reformers and administrators role of family society and educational institutions in inculcating values they've given it like five six points but according to me all of them are same how will you differentiate ethics in private and public life without context or what is the difference between the ethics they teach you in family school or society and the difference in ethics in say private and public life all of this are interlinked you don't need special points for all these settings all of them is the same what you need is those those words what we call as keywords that compassion perseverance determination courage of conviction spirit of service then uh, the voice of concerns uh, then selflessness devotion to duty so all these words is where ethics stands how do you connect these words and write a story is how your answer is presented and ethics and human interface is where you learn a lot of these words so this attitude attitude you learn a lot of these words but how do you learn these words how is how is this being inculcated inculcated in your minds in the in your existence in the society for the last 20 25 years so that is what we are seeing in ethics and human interface how do you explain a point of view with some justification so all that comes from the sub first chapter ethics and human interface so if you see this first topic of this essence determinants and consequence of ethics there may be some ethics professional ethics professors who may have written a book also on the same topic that is not something that we need for the exam so you have to be very clear the source materials you are reading for this exam are 12 standard books you read those books and how can you expect to write like a phd candidate in any of these subjects because that is where the gap comes in when you start writing mains you want to write like as if you know everything which we don't know because we didn't read in the first place we were reading 12 standard books your quality of answer is going to somewhere range between a 12 standard student and a graduation student because your books are limited to that level none of us have read any phd level books for any of these topics so have that in mind simplify the exam itself because the source material is simple if your mindset is simple then you will write like your 12 standard exam that is enough the context the content will be different because we are all uh, older people now we are all adults young adults so the way you think would have matured more so the content will automatically come the presentation and everything is very similar to your board exam keep that in mind and then we will see how this class goes so this essence determinants and consequence of ethics it's very simple how you have to remember all this thing and put it into words is that in this world the resources are limited whatever you have is always limited but your needs and will be unlimited because all of us have this desire to want more this wanting of more stuff the materialistic want or emotional want or any other form of want want will lead to greed and greed to control the greed that emerges out of human want is why you need ethics or morals or values that is what society conditions you for because if i leave you as an individual your personal interest may collide with the social interest and if everyone is going to become a radical and start working for their personal interest how will society run so there should be a binding glue for the society this binding glue is ethics or morals or in more legalized form it is law you understand right this is the big difference or the big uh, philosophy that everyone is going to teach you for why you need ethics or what is ethics with this you can write it in however way you imagine ethics to be 
because what I'm giving you is good context. This itself is 25, 30 words when you put it on paper. Just remember that and that will be the essence of ethics. The determinants of ethics is like why you need ethics. Talk in the social angle. So there, there is a collectivity to talk about. So like you guys want to take notes means I will write it on the board or if you want to listen to it as a story, I would be more happy if you do that because you will all get the essence of what I am talking because what I am talking is no rocket science, very simple stuff only. If you want it, I will also write it down so that there is a pace of taking notes. So people who are taking notes, you really want it that way, want it that way, no one, it's okay. The others, if you want me to go a little slow, I will go slow, go slow, fine, okay. See essence is resources unlimited. I will scribble a little, so just bear with me. Resources unlimited. Sorry. Resources limited. Sorry, sorry. Wants unlimited. Leads to greed. Ethics conditions you to control your greed. When I say control your greed, the next logical flow you have to go is, why should I control greed? I am controlling greed, uh, greed for social uh, social bonding or uh, let us call it uh, for the collective, for the collective, uh, uh, collective good, that is a good word. for preserving collective good in civilization. So the point is look at how I built a story. Do I have these points in my notes? I do not have. I have only two points. Resources limited needs unlimited. Humans are selfish by nature. The other things are all I am just writing. If you can see I did not have the phrases in my mind. While writing I am just bringing in words. So you should be comfortable in your English to write this. You, you do not have to go for English class. Whatever word you use is correct. Just be confident on that and use. Because how you present is all like this is all creative writing. So you can write it like a poet or an author or something or you can write it like whatever I know I will write good. That is also fine. So that is how you have to see. This is the essence. The determinants of ethics, there are so many determinants of how your ethics would be determined. Okay. By so many, I am only referring to socio, social determinants, economic determinants, political determinants, cultural determinants or uh, social, economic, political, cultural uh, there is religious and your uh, moral values. I have given you 6. If you write 1 point for 1 angle, 150 words is gone. So, like you do not have to struggle for writing points for this. What are your social determinants of ethics? Maybe maybe you may subscribe to the uh, subaltern view of society. You would say that social welfare is the most important thing in society. That is a social angle. Or you can say that empowerment of women is important. That is a social angle. I am talking about all the progressive values. Focus always on the progressive values. Do, like, don't go to ethics paper and write some of those regressive values because that is also a point. That that will uh, so that will not get you marks in the first place. And that is personally, I don't feel like those points should ever be written anywhere. So social is like you can write it from uh, the poor people's angle, the vulnerable section angle, the women angle. It's a tribal angle. These are all components in social values or the components of the social, the society itself, the people who are there. You understand? No, that is how you have to see. I will write it again because maybe taking notes is good for you too. So social, you can talk from women angle, poor angle, SESTs, then it is disabled. Sometimes people, a lot of people forget about disabled. You can talk about Divyangs. Divyangs is a solid point you can always write in the exam paper. If you do not know anything in say society or in ethics or anywhere else, in governance and social justice, bring a point on Divyangs bring a point on disabled because people talk about SEST, people keep talking about women, people do not talk about the Divyangs 
or people don't talk about sexual minorities, the LGBTQs. That is also a point because you know LGBTQ is something that all of us know, have whatever opinions you want to have, but on paper say that they are vulnerable and you have to do something for them specially. They are a special group of people, they are not the majority. And also have a concern for minorities. In case if you need a point, you can bring this also. So till now, I have not given you any point. I have given you only headings. Just with this heading, most of you will have some points you can fill under these headings. Is there anyone who feels that with these headings, I don't have a point to write? So can I assume that all of you have some point to write for women, some point to write for SCST, some point to write for disabled? You just need this spark in the exam hall. You get this spark, you will start writing. The problem arises because you will not get this spark in the exam hall. So this is why you write your mock test to get these sparks. Or if you don't know something, how do I connect and bring up uh, information that I already know and present it on the paper? Yes? Now coming to economic. Now when you come to economic determinants, now I have to show a difference in how people think based on their economic position in the hierarchy. Yes? The ethics of rich people may be different. Uh, maybe let's let's talk about uh, the culinary habits or uh, how how you uh, uh, think about food itself. Fine dining is a concept concept of luxury. You can't go ask a poor man to do fine dining. Maybe he has never done fine dining in his life. By fine dining, I'm meaning go to some five star hotel, stay in that hotel, use all those fancy forks and spoons, learn how to eat everything without the use of your hands, and then you do something. It's a, it's a, it's a means of luxury, or at least in our country, it is that way. So that is a, that's a mentality or that's a way of life you are cultivated because of your position in the economic ladder. A poor person is not going to think like that or work like that. He is happy being in a Kayendi Bhavan. He will pay 20 rupees, get a meals, get done with it, go back to his daily wage work. Right? There is a thinking mentality that will differ in where you are positioned in the economic hierarchy. Based on the context they give you, you can make a comparative study of how these two people think. You can make it as three sections, the middle class, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rich section, the bourgeois and the proletariat. Bourgeois and proletariat are sociological terms. I am just telling bourgeois means uh, land owning people or people who are rich. Proletariat means uh, the working class, the people who do not own land, who have to depend on daily wage labor. So now you have three people to talk about in economic, ang economic angle alone. Now come to political. Now this is something you have to handle properly. Don't go and name political parties or say right wing, left wing and all that. We are not interested in any of it. There is a political ideology of how things should be done. Everyone in this country wants to do good for the country. They just have different ideas. So you talk based on those ideas. So what are the different political ideas with respect to development or ethics we have in this, in this country or anywhere in this world? The two extremes are capitalism and socialism. Both extremes won't work. Everyone knows. We are a mix of both. Even US is a mix of both. Okay, because in US also there is a concept of food stamps, social security schemes, uh, you get your, uh, they have that 401 k or something for their retirement and everything. It's all there in uh, US also. The most capitalistic country also has all these things. So you have to talk in both these angles. One way you have to focus on efficiency, profit and other things. On the other side you have to balance it with equitable growth, equal distribution of wealth and then social welfare. One will increase the size of your pie. You need capitalism because if I have only 100 rupees, I can only redistribute 100 rupees. Capitalism will ensure that 100 rupees will tomorrow become 200 rupees. So if I can make 200 rupees tomorrow by capitalistic thought process, then if I will, if I am balancing it with social justice or social welfare, instead of giving 50 rupees for social welfare, since my pi has increased from 100 I have become 200, now I can give 100 rupees for social welfare. Understand, right? You need capitalism to increase the size of your budget and you need social welfare so that you redistribute it, redistribute it for the poorer people. You understand the compar comparison I am giving you? This comparative thought process is what will get you marks. You can just talk about capitalism saying this, this, this is bad. What is there in that? You will keep telling bad, but in practical situation you need it. You can't suddenly go and change the whole system and say I will create a socialistic country or I will create a socialistic model that is sustainable. 
we have to focus on sustainability so that way you balance it this way so now we have given a very solid point to talk about and this is a very generic point you can use anywhere in ethics or in governance so for political keep it as uh, this capitalist and uh, socialist ideology and the story i told you the same story you can tell it in other words also that is all fine you will still get the same marks now cultural now cultural is where you get this concept of liberalism or conservatism we most of us would come from a conservative uh, family because our country is uh, very much conservative in terms of its cultural values religious values family values and social values so that way you can always talk in this extremes of conservatism versus liberalism we always treat that the west is liberal liberal is not always good conservatism is not always bad so don't have value judgments passed on these things just use it as pointers depending on the question that is being asked give a traditional view or a conservative view or give a a progressive or liberal view just understand based on the context understand the nuance of how to manage these two because for example let's say you get a question on lgbtq let's say we you don't want to ban uh, uh, the lgbtq thing that uh, i think 377 correct no ah. 377 like decriminalizing 377 is progressive because that's what the rest of the world is doing that is what we will also eventually do so you always talk in those progressive liberal lines in some situation maybe uh, in terms of family if they say that the family structure is weakening if you talk that maybe take a conservative view it's okay on paper it is okay everything is okay take a conservative view and say if the family system breaks then we may need a new way of raising children in society one important function of family is for raising children in a set, in a so in a way that is acceptable to society understand our parents mold us now if family as a concept itself is not there who will raise children who will teach them what is good what is bad who will show them this world all those question comes up point is i'm not saying parents are the only one who can do this if family structure is getting destroyed then you need some other structure in society that will take up these roles that will do these responsibilities and functions so this is how you should balance an ethics paper there's there's never a straight forward answer and nothing is right or wrong so this is for cultural for for cultural you treat it as conservative liberal how you can show differences is based on whatever you see in society family is something you can say lgbtq is something you can say with respect to caste also you can say in some way caste helps people in rural areas for people who cannot get justice in the legal system because of the number of pending cases and the amount of time involved and the cost involved these caste panchayats give them instantaneous solutions instantaneous justice that is why dismantling caste is a very difficult and long process you can explain this and say if the legal justice system is improved for faster justice like providing justice without delay then that will be instrumental in dismantling caste get it no this is a cultural way of bringing caste and linking it to judicial system or bring caste and link it to service delivery because when a government scheme is being brought up sometimes in the in the district level or in the block level scs and sts are prevented from uh, availing these schemes that's because of the local caste structure if your service delivery if your governance structure will, will avoid all this uh, caste discrimination at the last mile delivery let's say through e governance systems or digital governance then that way you can dismantle caste you can take up take caste privilege out of the whole system itself it's about how you create new systems to avoid all the problems that are there in the current system so if you keep your mentality that way then you will start generating points it's just that recipe spark you connect it to something that you already know and you will write now come to religious values religious values based on the question that is being asked talk in terms of caste talk in terms of women empowerment talk in terms of patriarchy and maybe also talk in terms of communal harmony and universal brotherhood now you can ask me like is it like i have mugged all these words so that it flows it's just that in my mind all of this stands as a story so when i say one word the next link i will have is go to the next word because i remember it as word after word so you can read it as uh, what do you say communal harmony and uh, universal brotherhood so over here now you can give a comparison 
you can give a comparison of how things are in the Middle East, how things are there in the West, say Europe or US, and how things are there in India. Or if you know, you can also compare it to the uh, East Asian countries, compare it to say Japan or China, Japan, China, Korea. They're, they have nuances within their culture, but overall, as someone writing the Indian bureaucratic exam, that much nuance is not needed. You can treat all of them as very similar and say, in comparison to East Asian societies, uh, our family system, our family system is more similar to the East Asian societies. It's not similar to the West. So you can bring point, you bring these comparative points. It will look like as if you don't know anything, but when you make it a comparison, you will always know. This is there and then moral values is something you can write from your personal ethics. For some people, alcohol is a taboo. But for some, social drinking is fine. There are families in this country that do family drinking. Understand, right? There is a difference. Different people come up with different morals. That way, anything that is not illegal or anything that is not causing public disorder is legally fine. So that way, all that will become your moral values. If you treat it that generally, depending on the context being given, you will generate points. So for moral, focus on personal values. You will keep telling other people, no, like, na idu panna Like, this is like, I will not do this or I will not do that. I am fine doing this. Maybe most of you would be fine or most of us would be fine uh, doing some, uh, uh, let's say, committing some uh, civic offense. Sometimes you won't see the traffic lights, you may jump a traffic light. Now, in our society, it's like, okay, if you jump a traffic light, it is a mistake, it is a crime. But it is like, sometimes it just happens and you don't worry about it, you just keep going. But say in, say, Japan, in Japan, I don't think the people are, are brought up in, with such values and morals that if they do any such civic crime or civic mistake, those people will just stand there and start asking sorry. That is a culture we don't have. In Korea, the people do not steal at all. Uh, so in Korea, uh, so you will have shops that will not have, it will not be manned. You will have those vending machines and other uh, uh, cupboards and with all those uh, lace chips and Cheetos and everything, all those chips on the road. There won't be anyone around. Nobody will steal those things and run. I know this because I stayed there for some time uh, for when I was working in Samsung. I was very surprised that the society is brought up in such a way that none of them will steal. Because if they steal, it is seen as a dishonor to the family. If the son steals, it is seen as a dishonor for the father. If the father steals, it is seen as a dishonor for the whole family. And honor is very important for East Asian societies. In our country, it is not as strong as how it is there in East Asian countries. You understand the nuances of how to write? So there is the East Asian angle which will say that this family, honor, tradition, these are very important. West as a more individualistic point of view. India is somewhere struggling between these two. We are a mix of everything just because of the vastness of the country and the differences and diversity we have. So this itself can give you ways to write an answer. I am telling you with respect to something I saw. This you can do for other questions also. So focus on your personal ethics. Hmm. This is determinants. Then consequence of ethics, nothing new. Whatever I said just now, if ethics is not there, what will happen? You keep telling that something wrong will happen, how will society survive, where is the collective good, you can't prioritize personal greed. From an individual and social view, you keep telling. Uh, if ethics is there, now tell positive things. Ethics will condition humans into uh, holistic beings that are ready for having uh, a communal society that will depend on each other for each other's benefit and uh, each other's prosperity. You can write something like this, that is your consequence. So this is the whole topic. Out of this, I don't think any of you need notes anymore. Whatever question comes, you will be able to write something with these pointers. So fine with that, any questions to ask? Okay. Then we will go to dimensions of ethics. I'll go a little bit fast because I I want to cover a little more. Uh, okay. Now with respect to dimensions of ethics. Now dimensions of ethics is not something you don't have to read. Go read uh, Aristotle or Socrates. If you are a philosophy optional student, use all of that. Get those extra 20 marks in ethics because for you it is very easy, the cost or the time that you need to invest is very low. But for the other people who don't have philosophy optional or say psychology optional, uh, we will go with these five approaches. 
the approaches that are there are called one is utilitarian approach by utilitarian approach i will always do something or take some action that will give me the maximum benefit i always look at the utility value of any decision by utility value the purpose what am i getting out of it what is my self benefit or what is my social benefit that i take because of a, a decision i will always maximize maximize my benefit and i will make sure that i do little harm or i do the least harm warfare is very costly but at some point you have to go for war if you want to protect your territorial uh, sovereignty so can you go there and sit and talk that war is not good for society so i will not come to war your enemy will come occupy your country go what will you do there you have to take a utilitarian approach you have to go to war you have to maximize your benefit at the least cost so that not many people die you don't go and kill civilians you don't do uh, war crimes you you maintain this balance or with respect to development versus environment protection you need development but if you need development you are going to cut trees so you can't say that i won't cut trees and don't do development or you can't say i will do development and i will cut all the trees in this world both are not going to happen you focus on your benefit more and then you try to minimize the harm or do some alternative so that the harm is minimized the negatives are minimized this is utilitarian approach these are pointers to think if they ask you to take a decision give me some de- like options that you have for a, for taking a call these are ways to generate those options one is utilitarian the most easiest second is rights rights based approach so now in the modern society we have these rights called human rights then you talk about animal rights you talk about environmental rights now another new term that is coming up is climate rights so when you have all these rights you say that any human that is born in this world or any life that is born in this world has some set of basic minimum rights that are given to it by god or by law or by any any supreme uh, power which according to different people will be different different things so there are some rights that are seen as universal so you always take a call in a way that these rights are ensured for example now think of a cause of uh rights based approach you can think of a cause of uh, take rte right to education we gave the right that in this modern society in india any child less than the age of uh, 14 and greater than 6 should get compulsory education and you built a system to give that how good or bad the system is all that is gs2 problem not gs4 problem okay so you take that that is a right you gave so when you write an answer relating to uh, how do you improve the economics of rural people or something talk through the terms of education talk through the terms of health say that you have to give universal health care because that is a universal right that every people in this country and the world should have idealistically we should have how soon we get it will depend on our economic systems so that is all operational issues but ethics paper is an ideal paper you have to talk about that utopian society you have to talk about that progressive society the ideal state where everyone is going to be happy and everyone is going to be prosperous so always have that ideal thinking and bring out what is your view of the ideal so that way in right right space approach you can talk about uh, this thing health education national food security ah national food security act that focuses on hunger you can bring all these ways and then you can write from there you can also say that there is a right to the city poor people live in slums and they don't have a access to the city itself right if you have seen those english hollywood movies you will see that under the bridges they would have spikes that is because in this country if poor people want they can go and uh, lie down for the night under a bridge in us they won't allow just to ensure that people don't come and sleep there or come and encroach there all their public infrastructure will have those spikes in compound walls you will see those glass bottles being placed no so that people can't cross you will have things like that under bridges in common uh, spaces so that in the night people don't come and sleep there the us infrastructure is hostile to its own poor people so now that is something that that society has come up with our society we are still not there at that level hmm? our society has not has not come to that level of extreme yes encroachments are bad but when you talk about right to the city you can't be you can't treat your own people as aliens or your own people as some some untouchables or it's it's not right at all so this is something you can write in rights based approach 
So this example is a, it's a very easy example. Most of us have seen Hollywood movies, just that we may not have focused on this specific point. So there are very, this, uh, note these examples, note this US example that I said, and also note the uh, Korean example I told you, regarding uh, stealing seen as a family dishonor or how it affects tradition. These are fancy points, but very easy to write anywhere. This is rights based. Then there is a fairness or justice approach. So what is this fairness or justice approach? Nothing. Say that all are equal. Irrespective of anything, all are equal. Say women and men are equal. Say there is no difference based on caste. Say that different ethnic, like you can't have racial discrimination. Blacks and whites are equal. There, there can't be any, you can't say that uh, Divyangs are not useful for society. Divyangs are special in their own way. Just because they don't adhere to the majority views on physical appearance and physical abilities, doesn't mean that they are, they are inferior or anything. Treat them as equal. Give them their opportunities, they will shine. Because I guess one of the years, uh, one All India rank one topper was a Divyang. I don't know her name, but I have seen her story and it was, when I read the story, it gave me goosebumps. So because give people the necessary opportunities, treat them fairly, ensure that there is justice everywhere and all are treated equally, then everything is good. That is how a system should be designed. Have this approach. Then fourth is common good. So there is an approach of common good. Sometimes what happens is, let us say a new railway station is coming up. Now this means close to wherever I am developing the railway station, I am going to do some land acquisition. While doing this land acquisition, there will be some private properties that the government will take over. Fair compensation, uh, like uh, uh, taking care of their needs and providing them whatever they want, so that this land can be acquired is for the common good. For the welfare of four people, I must figure out a way to handle the discomforts of one person. Like the numbers, I didn't use well. So let's say put it the welfare of say 4 lakh people, it's okay if you uh, do something for 4 people. You, there's a Tamil dialogue also, <laughs> most of us would have seen. It, it's, it's a point like that only. That is a way to look at uh, solving your uh, ethical dilemmas. When you take decisions, nothing is concrete. When you take a call, there are always people who will get affected and there are always people who benefit. You just ensure the affected people are affected as little as, as, little as possible and the benefits benefits are the highest. So you can treat that through common good approach. Yes, it is very similar. In utilitarian, you can also maximize your personal benefit. In common good, you focus only on social benefit. So this is a very academic difference. You don't need that in ethics paper. Because we are not becoming those uh, professional ethics professors or you're not writing those university courses. So that way, this much nuance is not needed. Then fourth is virtue approach. Virtue approach is our beloved Gandhi. So Gandhi, when he came to India, he had his own philosophy of Ahamsa, Satyagraha, and he said, if I do anything, even if I get independence for this country, it will only be, only be through non-violence. Why did we go to such kind of thinking? That was because that was Mahatma's virtue. His virtue was so strong, he held on to that, he's like, I am fine suffering for as long as possible, but just to solve my suffering, I will not go against my virtue. Because his virtue, he made that his virtue is the most important. He held on to that virtue. He propagated that virtue across the country. And then he was able to get us independence in a very different way with respect to the rest of the world. I don't think any other country got independence without bloodshed. You can say that there, there were other leaders who also did, uh, uh, like who also fought the independence struggle. And uh, we had the INC and uh, the Bhagat Singhs and uh, uh, Azads and everything, but at least, at least the, the common ground is that Gandhiji has done the most for our independence struggle to bring that pan-Indian uh, uh, unity and uh, bond, or what brought our country together. So that way, this virtue is something you have to talk about. Virtue will different differ from person to person. Some may be like, just because I'm not getting justice, it, it's okay to do violence to get justice. This is a mentality most people also have. You can say that irrespective of how much struggle I have, I will always only go to court, fight it legally and win my justice. Example, J.E.B. movie. J.E.B. movie is on the other side. Or take up some riots you are seeing in newspapers or the riots that have happened in this country that took violence to get justice. 
in both way both people want a justice because from their point of view they were always right the way to get justice differed one was violent one was non violent this is based on the virtue so this is the virtue approach so these five approaches if someone asks you to take a decision or how what will you do uh, there is something something happening you are district collector what will you do talk on these five angles is it implementable practical that we shall worry once we get to the other side but right now on paper you write these five points this is enough you can write a 250 word uh, answer with these uh, five angles so this is dimensions of ethics then after dimensions now we have ethics in private and public life or relationship and then human values so what i am telling is this ethics in private and public life or relationship uh, it's it's just a way of explaining putting things into syllabus but what they are asking for is all those keywords of yours perseverance courage determination uh, benevolence selflessness devotion to duty so i'll give you a list of words just note them and keep seeing those words again and again so that whenever you write a point in ethics that point must either use this word or carry the essence of this word i have close to 30 words so just have them i also don't remember all of the words there's a standard 10 or 15 words i kept i kept reusing all the time so some words will stick to you easily you don't have to struggle about the words that you forget it's fine you just need 15 words there's ah uh. okay now we will talk about uh, i'll just write it as keywords as heading and in the glossary and the other material that uh, deepak sir would have shared all there would be extra words and there would be definition of these words so there is this concept that while you are using these words they ask you to define no then they ask you to define you can go for an academic textbook version of the definition or you can write it in your own words in my case what i did was my preparation time was very less so the strategy that i am telling you would be very simple but that will get you that 4 4 out of 10 or that 6 out of 15 marks because that was my only aim i did not worry about getting a 6 out of 10 or a 8 out of 15 i was like it's fine if i don't get those marks it's fine i just gave up and i settled with 4 and 6 for 10 and 15 mark question so uh, why am i telling this ah this definition you can go for an academic answer or you can go for your your own style of explanation okay i will explain one or two words you will get the hang of it then decide how you want to go if you have already memorized use it if you have not yet memorized go with your own definitions there is no big difference because what is expected is the essence of the word itself if you can bring out the essence in your own words more than good you don't have to mug for uh, these academic answers so that way now we'll go to these words hmm okay love for justice it's it's not in any specific order so some of the initial words maybe like even i am not comfortable i have never used this love for justice word it's just there in my notebook uh selflessness respect for humanity dignity for all in this words you can see that continuation you have with the five dimensions of ethics i explained and what we spoke in essence ethics and determination dignity for all is what you you talk about treating all people as equal that fairness approach uh-huh. then there is loving and caring okay this is childish call it compassion benevolence benevolence is perundanmai perundanmai are kamba that is benevolence then peace loving peace loving or non violence like use it as non violence that's more standard then there is integrity discipline civic duty or civic sense consciousness lawfulness there is no difference between civic sense and lawfulness just different words telling the same thing ethical accountability you can be held account ethically accountable to your concerns or to god or to law whichever you treat as the supreme power then there is loyalty courage 
solidarity. Now solidarity is something that I personally use in a lot of places. By solidarity what we are saying is if someone else is struggling, I will at least show my solidarity to his suffering. Maybe he is poor, I am rich, but I will tell him that I understand your struggle. That is standing in solidarity with the, peop the, with the affected people. So that is why you see politicians going and meeting people who are affected. It is just a way to explain that I am there for you. Whether they are there or not and all is not a problem for our paper. Our problem is using this word solidarity in places where you can effectively use. Showing that the community is there for the people. Huh? Courage, courage. So solidarity, personally I use that word a lot. So if you have certain preferences like that, bring it out in the ethics paper. That is the only paper you can bring out. Solidarity and respect. So respect, dignity for all is all same. Uh, reason and inquiry for universal truth. So what is this universal truth? Truth itself is not constant according to a lot of philosophies. Okay, that's like you would have heard this. This world is a Maya. Everything is uh, temporary and all this. No, so truth is also temporary. There are some logics that say truth is temporary. But if you go with Gandhiji's way of thinking, he believed in certain absolute truth. This absolute truth for him is this non-violence, ahimsa, and some other ideas, which I have not read Gandhiji that much, so I do not know. But he has sold a lot of things. So this reason and inquiry for universal truth, saying that all people are all people are equal. There should be no caste privilege or caste discrimination. Now that is universal. There should be no racial discrimination. That is universal. Treating women equally to men. Paying women equally to men. Because women wages are always lesser than men wages. This is a constant struggle in uh, corporate. Government you do not have that problem. But in corporate and private sector that problem is there. We keep seeing that come again and again. So the universal truth is you cannot discriminate. So you should have the inquisity, the reasoning and the uh, and the, and the desire to go fight or fi figure out the facts so that you get that whatever is that universal truth. Understand? No. So that is this thing. Then there is social equality, contentment. Contentment means saying that it is enough. I am happy with whatever I have. So that is the meaning of this contentment. At some point we have to be content with our life or what we have achieved or what we have. I am not saying go tell a poor man that since he is getting uh, 3 uh, meals a day he should be content. He should not be content. According to me he should not be content. He has to improve his position. But say you have a home, you do not struggle for food, you also have a say a bike. It is okay to be content with that. Now you can aim for a car, then you can aim for a helicopter, all that will become greed. At some point, at some some level all of us will have to turn content or else you will not happiness in, you will not have happiness in your life and you will see the society with a lot of contempt you will see the society with a hatred that in this society i am not able to grow that person is rich he is enjoying life so it, it affects your the way you think the way of life you have and how you bring up how you handle your family dynamics and all that so this is why the contentment will give you peace in life this is contentment in civic consciousness, I have already written, selflessness. Uh, now we will come to our standard words, objectivity, honesty, all this I am not going to explain, leadership, openness. And now openness is very important in civil services or in any decision making roles. Point is when you go to the top, it is always lonely. So in, in movies you would have seen that there will be this Raja, this Raja will have like 3-4 ministers, whatever these ministers still this Raja will listen. He will not know what is the ground reality. You have seen movies like this, no? a lot of Tamil movies run on these lines. So that is because the Raja is not open to conflicting point of views. The Raja will only accept whatever comes from these 3 people. So these 3 people will essentially control everything and those 3 people will be evil, then the people will revolt, come to the Raja, then the Raja will realize and then he will become a good Raja and all that. This is what you see in movie. All that is because of this openness. You need to be open to a different thought process. If you, if you, if you say, if most of us are from Tamil Nadu, the Kaveri issue, 
you can keep telling that Karnataka is not giving us water, Karnataka is not giving us water. Now, now that means that you are not being open. You need to understand what is the problem. The problem is now Karnataka is also developing, we are also developing. So the water necessity is increasing on both sides. There has to be a water sharing agreement between these two states. Because the, the consumption has increased on both sides, the resource is limited. Right. So now Karnataka says that it wants more water for its development. We say that we have traditionally used this water. Now it has to go to a, uh, to a mediator, there has to be some compromise and some number needs to be arrived. How this number comes, who is the expert, will it favour Karnataka or will it favour Tamil Nadu, based on the numbers, that all is a different story. But in an ideal situation, this is what we must think of. We have to understand the legitimate con concerns of the people of Karnataka, because they are also our people. We must also understand the legitimate concerns of people in the Delta region, because they are also our people. If this is like a family, like there is elder brother, younger brother or elder sister, younger sister, you will keep fighting but end of the day you are same family, one has to compromise, the other has to take. It is the same story in, in any level. So this comes up when you are open. So when you understand this dynamics and you talk of the Kaveri issue, then it, give, it opens your mind to new stuff. Same with uh, say Jallikattu. So as someone who comes from the tradition of having this uh, sports event in, in their society, we may say that we need Jallikattu. Yes? But now think of someone who does not come from the same culture or same background. He or she may not understand. When he or she does not understand, if he is open to our point of view on the subject, then we may convince them saying that, okay, there are issues in the sport itself, but it is needed. There cannot be a very severe, very strict ban on it. If you can convince that, that person should be open. To convince someone, you have to be open. You understand? No, this is the need for openness. What I am giving you is just examples I am just bringing out to just explain on spot. You can write examples like this in your uh, exam paper. Just make sure it is always balanced. Do not go for some very controversial examples. Huh. Then there is responsibility, accountability, transparency, all same words according to me, but while writing just put comma and write. Work commitment, excellence, fusion of individual and social goals. where your personal benefit is also the community's benefit. Let us say uh, some of us become civil servants, it is for the society's good. Some of us become doctors, it is for the society's good. You get your name or your recognition as a doctor is your personal benefit. The service you provide is social benefit. That is fusion of individual and social goals. Uh, over this individual of individual and social goals, talk about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship create jobs. This country needs more jobs. So. Uh, give that high pedestal to people who are business owners, who, people who are enterprising, people who want to start companies. Res responsiveness, resilience, national interest. So these are the keywords which we will keep repeating and I guess you will keep hearing those keywords again in the next class, the attitude class because attitude class is where uh, uh, explanation for all these words and everything uh, would be given. Now I am just giving you the list of words that I was using. You do not need all these words. Once you write two ethics mock tests, what will happen is you will be comfortable that okay, 10 words of from this list I will always keep repeating, it will automatically come. So that much is more than enough. So it's 10.40. Do you guys want a break? Because we still have only one topic. So a break at this point is okay. Hmm? So we will take say 10 minutes break. We will assemble again by uh, 10.50 to 10.55. Please come back by 10.55, not more than that.
so okay uh, so welcome back to the class so the last topic we have for the day in chapter 1 is uh, that human values lessons from great leaders reformers and administrators this is a place where you can uh, uh, create all your buffer and filler points have them ready enak engiyadu point therilana nadula you say that this is a great man this great man is like this like this so because he is like this like this i will also do like this like this you can write something like that and that is a very valid strong point i'm just telling it in a funny way but legitly that is how you understand ethics ethics does not come come from the air ethics comes from a certain set of socialization and certain set of cultural and political context so that way your political context or your social culture is all determined by all these great reformers and administrators for example we we respect swami vivekananda very much and all of us in our childhood and school days we have uh, learned about this uh, chicago speech where he went and said uh, like all my brothers and sisters now that is something that was very radical for the age he did but for our society it was common because we live this philosophy of vasudeva kudumbagam or if you go with uh, abdul kalam's word then you have yadu mure yavaram keli that was told by some other tamil poet i know it because abdul kalam sir said it in uh, european parliament okay so just to set context clear so since we from come from this kind of tradition uh, what swami vivekananda said in chicago became became very huge and that is now a very historical landmark moment or moment similarly another speech that i will always remember is the high have a dream speech of martin luther king junior why do i know that speech it was somewhere there in my eighth standard ninth standard book back in the day when i read that that thing just got stuck in my head i don't think i will forget it uh, till i die so like this all of you have been exposed to certain kind of ideals certain set of people so you have your own list of people so you have to list down those people what is the thing that you remember about that person and then connect it to the keywords we saw here we saw all these keywords no for all the great personalities you can say all this is applicable because they are all the ideal men and women of this country and the world so how would that ideal men or women will have any negative qualities you can be one of these uh, this illuminati kind of uh, controversial uh, secret society kind of uh, thinking and say that no no this person had this kind of uh, behavior that person had that kind of behavior at least for the exam don't have whatever you have keep it with you don't write it on paper ideal men and women have are seen as ideal because they epitomize or they personify the best behavior in society best ideals in society so you just look up to them you try to emulate how they behave you try to understand their point of view and you try to walk in their footsteps when you walk in their footsteps is when you also get a chance to attain that greatness that buddhist concept of bodhisattva bodhisattvas walk in the path of buddha they help other people to reach enlightenment no it's the same thing that's a, that's a religious way of saying it these great leaders and reformers following gandhi or nehru or patel is another it's a, it's a realistic way of doing things in society not all of us are going to become monks not all of us are going to become fathers and priests in in different different institutions we are all people living our common life having certain responsibilities familial personal private everything work based everything so you are living within a certain context and you have restrictions so all these great men we talk about also live with also lived within the same context the same restrictions and yet they got this name as being the ideal people in this country in the society and the country so that is what they want to teach you and this is what they expect in the paper also the essence of what i told is expected in the paper how do you bring about this essence is through examples now this example different people have strategies of using different uh, uh, like some use ias officers what they did in when they were district collectors some use ips officers and talk about them using sahayam as an example is very common but what i am telling is you, to get those very specific examples you have to go research now do you have the time most of us won't there's enough to be done in gs 1 to 3 so most of us won't have so what i am telling is go with the personalities you have already learned in your life your school life and your college life so that way i have a list of people nothing fancy all of them are very common names that all of you would know i will just list them out and tell you how to include them in the uh, paper itself so we'll first go with the our standard standard leader <laughs> the first name is gandhi
Mahatma Gandhi. Now you have to create a certain set of phrases that you will commonly use, like a phrase that will use to praise someone. Gandhi is seen as a Mahatma because his heart and soul was beating for the poor and he was always looking to, towards an idealistic society. Is this a good introduction? Nothing fancy. I just, instead of saying Mahatma Gandhi, I said Gandhi is a Mahatma. Because it's Mahatma, he is a big man or he is a big soul. So you just write like that. Now this is a very strong introduction of how to write. You don't need fancy English, just use whatever you know, put in words. Just, it's, it's a way of connecting words with respect to ethics paper at least. The other papers also, there are ways. I will see if I can teach some of those tricks also because in science and tech and all, uh, science and tech and all, I didn't prepare anything. I had ways of uh, creating points on spot. So that I will see if I can tell you guys later. Uh, but this is how you have to do for ethics. So Mahatma Gandhi. So what will you talk about Gandhi? Go with the standard thing, ahimsa, non-violence, caste discrimination, how we spoke of origins, or what he thought of women, how we went and cleaned the toilets. You have the story of how we cleaned toilets in uh, Shabramati Ashram, no? That story is your point. You don't tell that in this, this year when he was in Sabarmati Ashram, he went and cleaned toilets. We don't care about all those facts. We say that he, he was a uh, upper caste man, but he went and cleaned the toilet. Why? He was showing sol solidarity. He was showing that all of us are equal. He was showing fairness and justice. All the things we spoke in the other topics. Right? Now you connect all those words to Gandhi's life or to any of the personality's life. And then you write whatever you feel. Because when I read about this uh, Gandhiji cleaning toilets, it, it gave me that nationalistic feel or this feeling that, yes, all people are one. There shall be no discrimination between people. You understand, no? You get that kind of sense. Maybe you may not have to feel it personally, but rationally, logically, your mind will understand. So put those logical points on paper. So with respect to Gandhi, uh, Ahimsa, non-violence is there. caste equality and then there is Naitalim or maybe I am spelling it wrong, I don't know how to spell that. Uh, so do any of you don't know what is this Naitalim because it's standard, oh I don't know, okay. So it's standard part of ethics syllabus. So what Gandhi has given is that he has given a talisman. So Gandhi ji says that when you don't know what decision to take, like when you don't know how, like what, how will you maximize benefit or minimize harm and everything with respect to a certain decision. What you should think of is the last common man in this country. It's like, if the, like whatever you do, whatever decision you take, will it help the last man in society? The most poor, the most downtrodden, the most isolated person, the most uh, backward area, will it help them? If it helps them, then I will take this decision. If it doesn't, I will not. He made life as simple as that. He was like, If it doesn't help that person, then what is the decision I am taking? Why am I even taking this decision? What is the purpose? So you have to raise these questions in yourself and then you have to take a decision which will help the last man in this country. That is Naitalim. So this is something I kept using in the ethics paper, but once I read this, I am like, I am using this everywhere. If I have to take a call, I just, so I, Till now I have not taken a call to help the last man in society. I have taken calls only in family or in my workspace or things like that. Okay, so whenever I think, I see what should I do so that the people I am giving something to benefit. So you have that kind of mentality and this is something you can also include in dimensions of ethics. So in this page, dimensions of ethics, no. Put a sixth point and have Naitalim. So this is our beloved Gandhi. You can almost include him in every single answer in ethics paper. Don't be over jealous and <laughs> go write about Gandhi ji in all the questions. It becomes very monotonous and uh, I don't think uh, the examiner will allot good marks in all the questions. So that's why we are going to show variety now. So look at Gandhi's contemporaries. Now Gandhi's contemporary, we have uh, Nelson Mandela. Another very famous man present in almost all Indian textbooks. So I know all of us would have read about Lincoln, uh, sorry, uh, Nelson Mandela in at least one of your school classes, right? So that way, 
what can you connect to Nelson Mandela? Mandela fought against the apartheid rule. Yes, and Mandela did not talk about the rule of the blacks. He talked about a common rule where everyone is equal. Yes, he was not asking for retribution. Retribution means palivangarudu, vengeance. He was asking for a common society where everyone is equal, where there is justice, fairness and equality and dignity for all. Yes, that is what the man asked. And that is why he is, he is seen as an ideal man that we should emulate. This is Nelson Mandela. Always use the apartheid struggle as this example. You can connect apartheid struggle to compassion, to loyalty, to courage, to spirit of service. Uh, spirit of service. In this keywords, I will just give a few more words. Uh, like, something I picked up along the way. Voice of concerns. Manasachi. That is voice of concerns. Then there is spirit of service. Spirit of service is what Mother Teresa did. Like she gave herself for the service to help the poor people. That is spirit of service. Then there is courage of conviction. Courage of conviction means I know that this is right. I will do whatever in my capacity. Even give up my own life so that I will hold on to whatever I think is right. This is like a, like a army jawan who would give up his life so that he can protect the country. That is his courage of conviction. He is supposed to man that post till he dies. And he will do that. That's because that's the amount of courage he has for his own conviction. He came there to protect the country and that is what he will do. He or she will do. So that is courage of conviction. conviction. If I remember any other fancy phrase like this, I will let you know. Okay, I am calling it fancy phrase because that is how I usually talk. These are very strong uh, philosophies and very strong keywords. Okay, I appreciate really what these things mean. Just that when I talk to my friends or to people, I just use this way of saying these are fancy terms. Okay, don't think that I am uh, uh, maybe uh, not giving uh, the respected or the expected respect for uh, these philosophies. Okay, number three. Okay, fine. Number three, Martin Luther King Jr. Do any of you don't know who this guy is? Martin Luther King Jr. If you don't know, please raise your hand. It's okay. I just want to know if you guys also know all these people or not. So, okay. So, most of you know. So, just a background of how you write it on paper. So, Martin Luther King Jr. was a black activist in US. So, this man mobilized the blacks to get equality of rights in the United States for the black people. Uh, I consider this man as the second most important man in black history after Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. So, that way, why I know US history a little is because there was this movie called uh, uh, Patriot or something, talks about the American Civil War. So, I have seen that movie, so from there I have taken some people because I remember them. So, Martin Luther King Jr., when he mobilized blacks to get equality of rights vis-a-vis the, uh, vis -vis the white people, he was giving a speech in, I guess, San Francisco. I am not very sure of where he gave. When he gave the speech, 25% of the audience were whites. Okay, you, you may call someone as oppressor, but not all of them are oppressor. There are always good people on either side of the issue. 25% of the people were whites, the rest were only blacks. And everyone thought that this man is going to now uh, call for riots and call for uh, vengeance to mobilize the blacks so that there will be a civil war again because civil war happened during Lincoln time. Uh, Lincoln is a very contemporary figure. There will be a civil war again um, uh, that, so to get equality of rights for the blacks. But this man went on stage and he gave this high have a dream where blacks and whites can live as brothers and sisters, where we are all equal where our skin color will not determine our uh, opportunities. It was, it's a very wonderful speech. If you want to read that speech, even now if I even think of it, it gives me goosebumps. So there are some speeches that have really affected my life. This is one of those speeches. So Martin Luther King Jr., you always bring this I have a dream speech. That is your example. Use this and write whatever you want to write. So he is a great man. Whatever you write, he is much more beyond whatever we can put it into words. Okay, even authors have tried to explain the 
the, the aura and the charisma this man had and even they are at a loss of words. You and I are never going to do justice for these great people with whatever we write in our exam paper. So, be very creative, write whatever you really think about it, you just write. You may think that, I, I, am I overdoing these things? You are not. These are very great people. You are allowed to do anything you want. Just don't write anything negative, just because I said anything you want. This is Martin Luther King. Then you have Abraham Lincoln. So from now on, we'll start going a little fast. Now, Abraham Lincoln, I always write based on courage of conviction. So this is a US president, a white president, who risked his presidency, who fought a civil war, all for what? For abolishing slavery. The man broke his country into two. He's a president, the US president back in that time. This man broke his country into two just because he held on to his courage of conviction saying there should be no slavery in this country anymore. These are, these are radical things for the time period. Today we may say that all of us are equal, at least it is accepted on paper. Back in the day nobody did. So this is a day when we were also having lots of communal caste, religious, all sorts of issues. So this man went and said I will, I will risk a civil war, I will fight it, I will win it because or I will even risk losing my presidency and the country itself. Just because I cannot accept the fact that blacks will be slaves in this country. And he is not even a black. He is a white. He is the oppressor. Or at least that is how you portray blacks versus whites. No. But now this man did all that to win that war and he won the popular support. That is why we respect these great men. There are many people with a lot of good ideals, but they do not win the popular support of the people. Abraham Lincoln won the popular support of the people to abolish slavery. So that's why he's a very great person to talk about in any form of ethical dilemmas or questions. Then you have Mother Teresa. So now you would see that the four points that I gave first, most of it is political. Because I follow a lot of political history and political news. That's a bias I have. So that way not all of you have to copy the same examples. There is a personal trait you would have and you would have certain uh, personalities to talk about, use them. You cannot replicate my personality and I can't replicate yours. So Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is for compassion, empathy and all those, all those caring, loving kind of uh, uh, virtues that one must have in their uh, life. So Mother Teresa, the story I use is uh, how she begged, uh, so she went to an event it seems in Kolkata to ask for money, to ask for donations from rich people. So when she asked for donations from one rich guy, he spit on her hand. So this, this honorable lady, she said, okay, thank you for this, this is for me. Give something for my children. Now see, spitting on someone's hand is an insult. She said, let the insult be for me, give something for my children. So this is a very documented story. I guess it is there in NCRT English book somewhere. Uh, so I read it back when I was in school. So this is a story I will never forget. So this is something I write whenever I want to show compassion to vulnerable sections, compassion to tribals because you have to show compassion to those people because those people suffer odds we can't even imagine. Okay, there are, there are schools in this country which is just a, like there is only one room, four walls, there will be five, six students and say there will be one teacher. The five, six students will be in second class, third class, fourth class, fifth class. Who is going to teach them? What will they learn? Because these, if some of those people come up in life, look at the amount of difficulty they would have gone through to even, uh, even understand what is what in the society. If they come out of their village itself, it's a very big thing to understand. No, so that, so those are the angles I connect with Mother Teresa. So that way, this is for all the compassion and uh, love and uh, having that belief that these are all my people. To give you that kind of senses only, we use, uh, we can use Mother Teresa. Now six. Now six is Aung San Suu Kyi. So this is the uh, Myanmar uh, person. Uh, like I don't know, I don't know what post she had. Prime Minister or President. She, she. So this lady, she tried to bring democracy into Myanmar. And why I'm specifically using? If you see, look at the representation also. I had. The first few were men, the rest are women. You have to show the diversity. There have been great women in this country. You have to talk about them. So, if you show the diversity in your paper, it helps. Don't be 
too uh, male oriented or uh, female oriented Th there has to be a balance always so i'm not telling an examiner will have the time to go through all this the examiner will not know but subconsciously when he reads and he keeps reading maybe one time he will be happy reading a male personality and when someone writes a female personality there's there's a good feel there's always a good feel when you give a representation representation matters the most that's why we have reservation that's why there is affirmative action in the us that's why you say uh, there is no rep there is no taxation without representation this is why uh, the uh, uh, the american war of independence also happened because british was taxing the american people or the whites settled in america and did not give them representation in political power so the people who emigrated to americas from british britain they fought saying that we will not pay tax if you don't give us political representation because it all matters so that way ang sang suu kyi is someone you can say she gave her sweat ah uh, use this phrase so this is a phrase she will gave a sweat blood and tears for democracy in myanmar democracy and say human rights also point is you can keep adding whatever you want to add there because she has just an extremely uh, some extreme level of social service she has done i also think she is a nobel peace prize winner i am yes no uh. so this is ang sang suki so after ang sang suki now you can write about some more uh, women uh, personalities that you know uh, another person that i would use is sarojini naidu then there is vijay lakshmi pandit vijay lakshmi the indian representative in un she 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 was present during nehru tenure so she was a women representative in international politics which is again very radical so and indira gandhi was our first women prime minister yes she was our first uh, women prime minister till date us does not have a women president what does it speak of us and what does it speak of india keep all the politics and everything aside look at just for women empowerment and this political representation we have already had a women prime minister and a women president us doesn't and us by far is the oldest democracy you understand no this this shows the uh, this shows how our country is diverse and is different in different is different in several ways and how we are also better in some ways the west is not always better the west just it just got this brand image and marketing that it is the best in the world there are aspects where the west is also very bad and there are very good aspects in the eastern societies i don't want to say india see it as the oriental countries the eastern societies japan korea some of their ideals are really good so that way you can also have pandit vijay lakshmi here so this is enough depending on this you will know some more personalities have them if you find any of the stories i gave you as difficult feel free to skip them you don't need them all of us there are enough personalities in this world to talk about then one more page now this is all for leaders then go for administrators and if you look at all the leader example i gave you i gave you very broad examples examples that are claimed by everyone these are none of them are controversial figures nobody is going to say anything controversial about any of these people and be in mainstream society fringe elements can talk whatever they want but mainstream society will not talk bad of any of these people that is acceptable no always choose characters like that always choose personalities who are who are beyond any kind of uh, blemishes or uh, beyond any kind of uh, criticism or uh, any other negative uh, associations hmm? now we'll go to administrators for administrators i kept my choices very easy i used ms swaminathan first why all of you know green revolution connect green revolution to food security how it help the poor people not go hungry how it show the world that india is capable of self sufficiency it brought out our technical uh, technological prowess that this country can also revolutionize development this country can also compete with the uh, other countries for food security because as a poor country food security is your first option like if you have played any age of mps civilization those kind of computer games you would know that you first have to get your basic necessities done only then you can start building a military and all that 
those are just strategy games i have played in my childhood so you don't have to know that i'm just setting some context a poor country first has to focus on food if my people are hungry how will i ask them to go study first of all so this this kind of connection that you have to bring and right green revolution is an example i'm using so when i tell all this there's a certain kind of feeling or certain kind of way i'm projecting it right that is what i want on ethics paper if you can connect it that way then ethics you are very safe you will do really good so then there is sridharan sridharan is our uh, metro man a very uh, genuine person credited for a lot of infrastructure projects you can talk about him because infrastructural development is how a country grows if you don't provide utilities if you don't provide infrastructure for all the people then you cannot develop if i cannot provide electricity to a village i cannot bring development into that village if the women in the village have to travel 10 kilometers to get water where will the girl child have time to study even if i give her books she won't because she will be forced to go fetch water so that is where infrastructure is very important so use this man for infrastructure to explain why infrastructure is very important for social growth this is for food you understand the theme of how i have found my leaders there is a theme everyone is related to something or at least you relate them to something they need not be related you just relate to something and remember it that way now there is sam pitroda uh, now this is someone i took notes but i never used so this sam pitroda is in some way um, uh, like when rajiv gandhi was a prime minister he brought him in so that we can bring technology into this country the information it and computers and all that electronics to bring all that into india to bring that it revolution everything it all happened during rajiv gandhi period only so that time the sam pitroda was the uh, was the mastermind so he was the person who conceptualized a lot of those programs so that way i always relate him to technology and for the question as to why technology is important for uh, administration or social growth economic prosperity for that all of you have a opinion and that is your answer i don't want to explain why technology is important we know it is how important it is for public good you can give examples of chennai floods you can give examples of how uh, it helped during ukraine war you understand no? all those large scale events you bring it out rok set ah rok set you can daralam you can bring that also yes then we have tn session tn session is chief election commissioner so why do you need tn session so tn session shows that utmost honesty and integrity in conducting free and fair election and you know how important the election process is because that process determines who gets to have the final say in this country as the representative of the people if the process itself is blemished if the process itself is under controversy how would that give legitimate power to the political representatives of the country so that legitimate power to take decisions for the collective good comes from the election process and the election process has to be free and fair and for a free and fair election process there has to be a very stern administrator who will not be swayed by anything and who will always stand for the uh, for the absolute truth so that way tn session is very famous for being the uh, the best chief election commissioner the best chief election commissioner is a personal comment now then you have ashok kemka ashok kemka or you can also use sahayam so both of them uh, you can relate to the same thing so these offices they always fight for what they think is right so you can show them for all sorts of uh, ethical attitude as to so at the end of the day it is the welfare of the people that is of utmost importance so that is something you can connect to these offices now six vikram sarabhai vikram sarabhai established isro when india was seen as a cattle cart country or a bullock cart country so we were um, let's say we were ridiculed by the west that we were transporting rocket science technology in bullet car, bullet bullock carts march 20 la we were taking parts of rockets there are photos also available so we did it we may have been a poor country but we still understood Uh, some portion of the budget has to be allocated for all these advanced uh, technologies and we did it in whichever way possible for us 
So, that way ISRO is a very very important institution according to me because with respect to NASA or the European Space Agency, the Chinese or the Japanese space agencies, our cost of sending a rocket is several times low. We, like, like budget airlines Indigo and SpiceJet and everything, we are one budget uh, spacecraft developers. We like I think our Mangalyaan budget was 10 times lower than uh, uh, than the uh, Mars project of uh, NASA. 10 times lower. This is like we, we are one we are one budget enterprise who are sending um, uh, these drones and satellites and everything into space. Something now this is all patented technology for us. In the future, there will come a threshold point where we will have the most uh, uh, most profitable space industry, a most profitable uh, because it is cost effective. So, any private person who wants to send any satellites will start approaching ISRO. So, there is a lot of money to be made by the government that can be used for public welfare just because we spent money on research and development in, uh, uh, in uh, space technology, space industry. You understand? No, that way ISRO is very important according to me. So, that way that is how I used in my ethics paper. Then use Abdul Kalam. Abdul Kalam, I am like the way I see him is that he represents how the majority and minority can always live together in a country. The minority should never fear the majority and the majority should never be, uh, there should never be the tyranny of the majority. Okay. Th there should never be this discrimination. There should always be this compassion and sense of communal brotherhood and uh, harmony in society. So, that way Abdul Kalam represents all this that I told you right now. The man is an academic, the man was an excellent administrator and the man had the most popular support for any president or at least that I know of in recent history. So, that way look at the multifaceted approach this honorable man had and look at how we influence society. Nobody can talk like this is a man that nobody can claim as being representative of one community or anything. He is a representation of India. He has that pan Indian, uh, uh, this pan Indian connect and uh, everyone in India knows him. They do not know him as a Muslim man who became president. They know him for who he was. They know him for how good of a person he is and how much public welfare he always thought about. Yes. So, that is how you explain about Abdul Kalam. Now, now over here with respect to Sridharan, you can also add this person called Vishveshwaraya. Vishveshwaraya, so when did I come to know him? I came to know that there is a Vishveshwaraya Technical University in Karnataka and then Vishveshwaraya was a question that was asked in 2019 GS3 paper. Uh, explain uh, the uh, contributions of uh, Vishveshwaraya and uh, I guess MS Swaminathan in uh, the development of the country. This is a 2019 GS3 paper question. That is how I know the person or know the personality. Go read about him. This guy, so this guy uh, Vikram Sarabhai, these are people who built institutions in this country. When there was nothing there in the country, these are people who built institutions. They were the founding fathers of a lot of institutions. So, being the founding father of something is, is, is something that it is very beautiful in, in the way I look at things. It is because very few people can even think of being like that. To think itself there are only few people. And the number of people who succeed in founding something is rare. That is why these people go down in history as great people. So, that way Vishveshwaraya is also related to infrastructure development. Uh, so, there is another person also, uh, something you can connect with 2 and 6. I will write it here, okay. His name is Mahalo Nobis. Mahalo Nobis is the founding father of Indian Institute of, uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, ISI Kolkata. So, you can ask me why statistics is important or why I am focusing on that. Lot of planning at the planning commission level or at the most strategic level involves a lot of statistics because nobody has the exact information about any budget or anything. Most of it is approximation. These approximations are arise, uh, are formed because of formulas that are created by experts. So, that way Mahalo Nobis is the father of Indian statistics. This man put in the foundations for how GDP is calculated and all the other ways of this, uh, this, this surveys are there, no? Labor force survey, there is a family survey, health survey. A lot of this he had a part to play. He established the 
the backdoor infrastructure or the backdoor data collection that is required for decision making. Today you talk about data driven decision making, but this is something he did when we got independence. So that way he is the father of Indian statistics. Someone who built systems, the systems and processes that will eventually run this country. And he was very much involved in I guess the uh, second and third five year plans. So that is also there. Then we have, so these are for the administrators. So if you see here, there is a trend that I go with. There is institution building, there is food, there is infrastructure and for, for some fancy stuff I have technology and space industry. Some are staple items to always talk about, some are the futuristic items that should also be talked about. People keep telling you that you have to talk about futuristic conclusions and all this and that, no. This futuristic conclusion here is technology and ISRO. Connect ISRO to how it will be profitable and we will have a very flourishing space industry in India. Because this is, this, these are all uh, deep tech industries. If you move in early, you have the most effective product, you monopolize the market. Just like how Amazon is there for e-commerce or uh, you have a Swiggy or a Zomato for food delivery and all that. Something that is done at the state level, so it is, it's, that becomes your futuristic points. So you can use this, if you have better points to write, use them. Because I will give you like 20 personalities, this itself is too much. If I have used all this, I have not used all of them. Just that while preparing, I will always glance these things. So then the last topic for the day, reformers. Now reformers is where it is very fun. All your history knowledge will come here. For reformers, you can start with Kabir. How many of you have read this Kabir Doha? Those two line Hindi couplets. Uh, I studied Hindi till 8th standard, so I have read some of those couplets. I treat Kabir as the uh, North Indian Thiruvalluvar. So that way whatever I will write for Thiruvalluvar, I will also write for uh, Kabir. Because both of them essentially we are talking about uh, how, their, how a society should be, what is good in society, how you should be disciplined, integrity and all that, honesty, not to lie or how to uh, show compassion for the flowers and plants and other forms of life. So all that is what these people said and importantly they were at a point in time when there were very rigid caste based discrimination and very rigid religious ideologies, these people came and said that all people are one. So that way Kabir is very important and Kabir is someone that everyone recognizes. You can, there are so many people you can write but the impact or the, or the, or the effect that Kabir gives the other people may not give. Yes? So there is Kabir, then there is Guru Nanak, all are like you will write the same points only for everyone, just that in different different angles. For Sikhism, for Sikhism, Sikhs do a lot of charity, right? Why, where did that come from? It came because in their religious doctrine itself it is said like you have to do a lot of charity, you have to go help people. So that is how, that is the religious value also that is being brought up apart from the cultural value that we have in this country. So that and all you can write using Guru Nanak. Then Raja Ram Mohan Rai, this is a man I respect a lot because he abolished uh, Sati. The story of how he abolished Sati is that he gave those prayers and petitions to Lord Bentick. He like Bentick got convinced that this should be abolished, he got the law. His own mother disowned him for going against Hindu values or for going against whatever is the traditional values of that period of time. His own mother disowned him. And the man still held on to his courage of conviction and still went on to abolishing Sati. Today, so today Sati is like, all of us know Sati was a social evil. But think of back in the day, his own mother disowned him. So look at the kind of life he would have had and the courage and the conviction and determination he would have had to do this for the society. That is why these social activists or these reformers are very important people in society. Then there is Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. So this man focused on women education. Then you have Jyoti Bai Pule. Jyoti Bai Pule and Savitri Bai Pule. This is for eliminating caste and empowerment of all. Th 
dignity. So you can connect all those things. It's the same cast story that you will write. So you can ask me why I have not given you B R Ambedkar. B R Ambedkar was also somewhere you can always use. So personally, I told myself, let me give focus to Jyoti Bai Phule and Savitri Bai Phule, uh, because in in my or with the exposure I have, I have huge respect for Savitri Bai Phule because she worked for women and she worked for Dalits. That's a, that's a that's a double discrimination she faced. You understand, no? Being a Dalit is itself a discrimination. You are already disadvantaged. Now, if you are being a woman, that's another discrimination. So, this is like, th there's a dual discrimination that is there in play. To talk about that, I said, uh, with respect to this, I will use uh, these two names. Yes? And that way, if you look at uh, a black, a black woman, would be facing how many discriminations? Again, two only. Yeah, this only double discrimination. Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda, all of you know, so I am not explaining anything here. Then there is Periyar also to talk about. So, Periyar, if you, uh, so, so there is this conception that uh, you cannot show realistic tendencies and all that in the exam paper. So what I am saying is, there is a chance that you may not know uh, the uh, Phule's because they are based in Maharashtra, but we see them as pan-Indian figures. So Periyar may be associated to South India or Tamil Nadu in particular, but he is also known in the North. He is also a pan-Indian figure. So that way it is fine if you use Periyar also. Just do not write very controversially. because. Most of these reformers have certain set of ideas that are still not accepted in the mainstream. So it is okay if you do not touch those ideas and talk about the most idealistic ideas that everyone accepts. Yes? Periyar and uh, there is Sri Narayana Guru. Sri Narayana Guru is from Kerala. This man gave the concept of uh, one God, one people, I guess. That is something I need to check. But the, the phrase of one God, one people is something I liked. So that's why I remember this person, Sri Narayana Guru. So look at four words. He is now talking again, he is now talking about religious equality, he is now talking about uh, uh, caste equality, he is also talking about uh, the gender based discrimination, all that. They are all one. Just, just four words. His so whole philosophy is now on paper. Now, this is something you can do for reformers. So, in my view, whatever you have learnt here, this is the crux of your ethics paper. So, whatever questions they ask, you will keep writing all these things only. Uh, with your second chapter, that is attitude, then there is emotional intelligence, then there is moral thinkers, then there is probity uh, and civil services values or something. All that, we will once again talk about those keywords we saw and how do you justify these keywords from the reformers? How do you justify where this arises from the determinants of ethics? That social, economic, political, moral, cultural we wrote, no? That becomes one point. Apart from that, in this quotation based questions where they ask you to explain the quotation and justify or something, you can also bring in uh, all the books you have read. So, most of us would have at least seen Mahabharata series in Vijay TV. Yes, you all know some Mahabharata characters and you all know what they stood for. Use them and make a point. Because they give you the academic justification you need and what you write is what is the demand of the question. Yes, you can use Mahabharata and make a point out of that. Use Ramayana. Then use the Bible also. You, you, you can liberally use all these things. So, Bible is something I used but so I, I cannot, so I have always ensured that I am not quoting word to word from any of these books because I cannot remember. And most of you also, it's, it, I would prefer that none of you go mug some verses not needed. Paraphrase, write the essence in however way you understand. Because Ramayana and all has some 100 versions of uh, explanation. You be the 101st explanation, it is fine. You do not need a mediator between you and God. You can talk to God directly if you are reading some myth mythological uh, stories, then you read whatever you understand is understanding that God gave you. You can treat it that way and you can be uh, satisfied that whatever I am writing is also an explanation. You do not have to be an authority and give an explanation. Yes. 
because I am pretty sure that whatever we come up, those 100 people would have already said. 1, 2, 3. Uh, Quran, if you guys know something, use it. Then the other religious books also. Uh, if you ask me what I used in my exam paper, I have used Mahabharata, I have used Ramayana, and I have used Bible. So all three I have used. Uh, the other things, I, I am not at all exposed to them, so I, I have no information on the other books. If any of you have information on those books, use it. It is always good to read a point like that. It's, it's unique, it's different and it shows original thinking. You are not copying anyone's idea. Even now, I am telling you how I did things. I am not asking you to copy all this. Even if you copy, you will not copy in the way I, am, I, I wrote my paper. That is where originality comes. You don't have to break your head to find originality. You just have to sit and think and automatically it will flow. So this is one set that you can use. Apart from this, another way of getting points is do these comparisons. Rural versus urban. Gender based. Tribal versus mainstream. Linguistic divisions. Religious division, uh, divisions. Comparing east to west. Uh, comparing east to west. And, uh, this is enough, six points. So, without any context of any question, what you know is, you know that urban people have more opportunities, they are more aware, they are more exposed. Rural people are going to have traditional values. Don't think that I am stereotyping, but this is how you do, do this comparison. No, this is how you write your points as GS 1, 2, 3. One, two, three. So, rural people, uh, you can say that they are not aware, they don't have enough opportunities, they still struggle with this caste class continuum, the struggles of those things. Because in urban areas, it is not very visible. In rural areas, it is terribly visible. So, that way this rural versus urban is an angle you can always use. Because you know, you have an understanding of rural, you have an understanding of urban. Whatever question is being asked, compare it with these two. Now, that is a good solid point. Similarly, gender based. So, with respect to uh, equal wages in workplace, men may have a different idea, women may have a different idea. Yes, men can boastingly say that we do more work, so we need to be paid more. But equality says that both needs to be paid uh, at the same time. So, in, in corporate, you have uh, extra leaves for uh, women, that one extra day per uh, month. Now, there have been uh, questions raised as to uh, why should not men get that extra one day. Now, these are ethical questions. There is no right or wrong here. These are ethical questions. So, based on the morals and values we imbibe in society, a decision is being taken there. So, these are something you can talk in gender based uh, approaches. It is a comparative. These are all comparative approaches. If any of you come from art background, you know that there are comparative methods to compare. Because comparing two things means you need to know something of both and it is seen as a very academic point in the first place. Comparative methods. Tribal versus mainstream. It is the same rural versus urban angle, the same thing for tribal versus mainstream. Then linguistic division. What do I mean by linguistic division? So, based on your linguistic and religious division, a certain set of cultural values being accepted, right? Cultural values. For example, there was breast tax in South India uh, during uh, early British period. So, now that is something, I do not think that was present in the north. That was the cultural difference. But in the north, women used to veil. So, they will used to put this uh, uh, parda, like the parda kind of thing. Women, all women used to veil their face, like as if nobody can see it kind of thing. So, in Rajasthan, it is still continued. They have uh, goon gut. It is called as goon gut. I will write it down. Goon gut. So, all this is because of the cultural differences within the country. These cultural differences can be demarcated in terms of language and religion. So, that is why I call it as linguistic division and religious division. So, um, uh, in some sense you can uh, compare the status of women in different religion or how it works in different states. Just do not be too controversial, just write it in a very balanced point of view. You cannot say that the south is more progressive and the north is regressive, it is not like that. There are some aspects where we are doing better and some aspects where that our northern brothers are doing better. 
just focus on those things and then that is where you can show your answers. These are really good ways to write points. This is for linguistic and religious divisions. Then last is comparing east to west. This is the international angle I always show wherever I, whenever I write an answer. So compare the eastern societies with the western societies. Western society according to my view is very individualistic. Okay, at some point the society has turned very individualistic. There is a pursuit of excellence for the individual and not much community thinking or collective good. Yes, that is the notion of capitalism itself. But with respect to the eastern societies, this concept of family, honor and tradition is still very strong. All of us still feel that we have a responsibility to our parents. Yes, and our parents still feel that they are responsible for the growth and development of their uh, uh, son or daughter. It is not very individualistic. I am not saying West does not do that. The difference is that over there the pursuit is individualistic, over here the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of money or the pursuit of uh, getting a recognition is family oriented or collectively oriented. That collective versus individual is the difference I always see between east and west and that is why I write my point also. Yes, this is another six ways of generating points in case you get stuck and you do not know anything. Okay, you know these six angles, any context being given, so this is like I, all my teaching is all of you know Pythagoras theorem that okay I have forgotten the formula this is <laughs> Pythagoras theorem is there the formula is what I am giving you based on the question based on the triangle given to you you just apply it with the values and then you solve no similarly use this and solve your question this is analytical writing this is also most of us have done analytical writing but only mostly in English paper the other subjects if you are uh, not done rote learning and if you are written on your own then you would understand this better. But apart from that all of us have written analytical writing at least in our semester exams. So this is not something new to you. All of you have done this for the last how many years of education we have had, we have all done this. So we are once again doing it for an exam. So with this I think I will conclude my class. There is still 10 minutes. So maybe I will show you one or two questions from my uh, mock papers. And if possible I will also share those mock papers with all of you. I will ask admin to do that. Uh, we will have that. and. Uh, Okay. Oh. Okay, this is the paper I wrote in November, so wait. And ah, this is in this I think this was the uh, last ethics paper I wrote. The total given here is one out eight point five. Uh, but there is some totaling mistake, it should be 110 or 113 something, I am not sure. Uh, fine. So this is a question where they ask what does public mean in public service, what are the values necessary for a public servant? This was a 10 mark question, this is the question that was asked. So what does public mean in public service? So you do not have to break your rate, right? just write whatever is your understanding of what is public. So if you look here I have wrote the citizenry population because the people are the public so you write the people. Then the public assets, public alone you, you cannot treat the people alone as public, no. There is a lot of common properties and everything which you have to bring. So that way I wrote about pro public assets like buses, roads, street lamps, the poor marginalized sections of the society. Then I would have talked about environment, forest, environment, wildlife to show concern for the other forms of life also. And then you can also treat that the outsiders, the tourists, the foreigners who come into the country as also public. Because if any law and sort of situation happens, we are responsible towards them also. Yes, this is just creativity. Uh, there is no template to this. This is something I, I thought of during the examination and I just wrote. But this is a good answer. Because look at the angles I am showing. You talk about the common citizen, you talk about the public asset, you talk about wildlife, you talk about the marginalized and you talk about these outsiders, the tourists and foreigners who bring us foreign remittance. And look at the number of words, I do not think I would have written more than 75. I think it should only be 50 words, if we count it, it will be only 50 words. So this is very essential because you need to complete the paper and make uh, like get those good marks in every question. Then this is the values of a civil servant. So Nolan committee is something all of you would have read, it is either Nolan committee or you would have read that second ARC report, both are same. Nolan committee was done in UK, second ARC is Indian concept, both were saying the same thing only. So that is why I am telling whatever you write it will be present in any report somewhere. 
because none of us even have the basic expertise to go give recommendations in the first place. The people who write these reports are all having 30, 35 years of experience. So Nolan's committee and then I wrote all those keywords that we spoke of. Selflessness, devotion to duty, compassion, honesty, integrity, transparency, look at, just put commas, keep writing because we have 30 words. <laughs> just keep writing how many ever words you want to write. Then there is zero tolerance to corruption, accountability for outcome, emotional intelligence, probity and serv servant leadership. This all came from ethics syllabus itself. I started writing, then I'm like, okay, there is still half a page to write. <laughs> Take from the ethics syllabus itself. Write emotional intelligence, write probity, write transparency and everything. Care, concern and innate desire to serve the nation and its people. In simple words, it's compassion, empathy and, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, feeling to serve. Yes, just that I put it in different words. On the time I was not able to get those keywords into my mind. Okay, I think the other paper has questions, so we'll move to the other paper. Hmm? There's a difference of one month between these two papers, but if you ask me, there isn't much difference in uh, how I answered. Because I want to talk about those quotation based questions. Because that's where I know people struggle. Uh, so, this is a good question for you guys to see. So, I will read out the question, some people feel values keep changing with time and situation while others strongly believe that there are certain universal and eternal human values. Give your perception in this regard with due justification. It is a 10 mark question but this is a tough question for you to write within 120 to 150 words. So, you will most probably write more words here. So, what they are asking is you need to show that these values keep changing over time but there are some values that are seen as universal. The moment you read this what will strike you is. So, based on whatever we have discussed, 200 years ago maybe Sati was seen as a value. Today it is not a value, it changed. But human right is a value today and I do not think anyone can ever uh, take away human rights from anyone. Yes, that has become universal. This is, this is the kind of uh, comparisons and what is expected on the paper. So, point is with respect to everything you have studied for GS 1 to 3, you already have the content. Now, bring in the comparative ideologies I spoke of, the comparative methods I spoke of. Use that and uh, start writing. That will be your pointer. Think on that line, then fill in the content that you know. This is like in semester paper, just like how you put in heading and then start writing something under the heading and where the heading will get ticked and you get your marks. It's similar to that. Yes? So, now this is the introduction I gave. Values are morals, uh, values are moral, religious, traditional, economical and modern in nature. Different values grow in different eras of human history and hence they do keep changing with time and situation. Just a simple introduction. This introduction is, is it adding any value if you ask me, it is just starting the flow. Maybe I should not be given any marks for the introduction itself, but it is required, you still have to write something there. Example, the Varna system endorsed discrimination through caste hierarchy, but with modernity all men are equal became the new value of humanity. I am showing the, uh, the changes in the values of society, the first part of the question, nothing fancy. Caste is something you keep reading all the time. Then, Jajmani system created a owner servant relationship of mutual reciprocation, but free market principle brought equal condition for ownership to all. The same caste thing only I was seeing from my economic angle. First was the social angle, now is the economic angle. In the current state of human, now that is enough, two points for the first part, second part of the question. In the current state of human progress, certain values are indeed seen as universal and eternal. Liberty, equality, fraternity, French Revolution, came up in French Revolution, all of us will hold on to that. This is like, I, I, like, I do not know what will happen in 200 years, but I do not think human society will exist without these anymore. I do not think it will ever happen. Women write emancipation and empowerment. You do not have to write all three words, just write one. Just that when I start writing, all those keywords will come up and I will just put comma and keep writing. So that is with constitutional backing. Hmm. Then secular values in a, a multi-religious, multicultural society. You understand from the template, 
there is a social, economic, political, cultural, religious values that I keep talking about. It is the same thing that I repeat. Secular is from religious angle. Women empowerment is from the gender angle or culture angle. Equality, liberty and fraternity is a political angle. You get it, no? From the, the template in dimensions of ethics or determinants of ethics, we gave six points. Yes, it came from there. So, secular values, I just wrote Mahatma Gandhi. So, over here if you see the secular value, third point, you can write Mahatma Gandhi, you can write constitution, you can write Swami Vivekananda, you can write whoever you want. Because all ideal personalities spoke about this. So, just to give justification, you use any of those names. Then fourth, compassion towards the marginalized, labor rights, human rights and the right to dignity in life and death. Now, this phrase right to dignity in life and death was, was, was popularized during COVID. Because in COVID, the dead bodies, the, the condition in which the dead bodies were handled or how it was buried and everything, it was very traumatic to see in pictures. So, all these people who talk in TV debates started asking for dignity and death. Dignity is life is something we keep talking about, but there has to be dignity and death. There cannot be mass burials or uh, mass cremations. Where is the dignity for that person, that individual that he has existed in the society for so long? So, this was a question that came up. So, I copied that phrase, right to dignity in life and death. Did I personally go sit and research to get these phrases? No. There are some phrases that will come in your life. Use those phrases. That alone is enough. You don't have to find out, like spend time reading uh, reading that big TV or Rajya Sabha TV, Sunset TV and all that, see those videos and get points. Not needed. Because I tried doing that in my first month of preparation. It was absolutely unnecessary for uh, the UPSC mains exam. This is from Universal Convention for Human Rights, United Nations. This Universal Convention for Human Rights, I have never read it. I know that this exists. Some 170 or 171st convention in UN. This was a previous year question, 2017 or 18 prelims question, it was there. So when I was solving the prelims question, I saw this. I just said, okay, let me remember if I use it somewhere, I'll use it. Now this is all we'll see later. This is emotional intelligence. Is it okay if I take another 10 minutes? Yes? Ah, this voice of conscience also is something you can see. So, this voice of conscience I got from previous year question only. I have not seen it in any books. So, when I saw this question, I did not know what the academic definition of voice of conscience. I just wrote whatever definition I could think of. So, voice of conscience. It is a strong voice of our inner self. That is the heartbeat of our moral leanings, philosophical groundings and ethical integrity. Now, this last three phrase would look very academic, but I got this from my optional sociology preparation. In one of the thinkers, when I was making notes for that, I had the same phrase. From there, I just used it here. So, most of you in your optional preparation will also have phrases like this. Just, just see them as phrases and be creative in how we are including it here and there. Okay. In Gandhi's words, an ethical moral person with utmost integrity and honesty has the strongest voice of con conscience to heed to his inner voice and fight against injustice everywhere. So, the point is, it is like all of us will write the point to just give it some values I just wrote in Gandhi's words. It can still be in Nehru's words, it can still be in Patel's words. Yes, they are all great people. Till then, then write whatever you feel about voice of conscience. So, he or she may be the truest to Satyagrahi in their fight against injustice. So, this is for explaining voice of conscience, whatever is the definition. What did I say? I just said, it is your inner voice that will help you fight against injustice. And then to give it some justification, I used Gandhi uh, as an example. And then said that the truest to Satyagrahi will have the highest form of uh, voice of conscience because he was fighting against injustice in the most non-violent way. If I write it again, whatever I told you is what I will write. I can't replicate the same words. I will be very honest about it. I can't replicate the same words. Every time I write, the wordings will differ. It will depend on what words come into my mind at that time. So, how to learn to heed to your voice of concern? That was the second part of the question. So, put that as heading. This is very simple. In 12th standard, whenever you write those long answer questions, there will be parts in the questions. You would have made a heading here and there. Same thing only. Nothing new, nothing different. So, how to learn to heed to your voice of concern? There has to be mental calmness through yoga. Mental calmness is something I know. For justification, I added yoga because it gives you calmness. And other methods of control over physical senses. The truest sense of ethical integrity and honesty to uphold social morals for 
societal being. Uh, so you should be integ you, you should have honesty and integrity in your life to heed to your voice of conscience. If you are already influenced by greed, then you you are influenced by greed. You will not be listening to your voice of conscience that talks about what is right and what is wrong. Right? That's what I said. You just have the truer sense of integrity and honesty. Then learning and imbibing moral stories of uh, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bible or Quran and othering to Dharma at all points in time, points or points in life. Because because it's like there are many paths to salvation, different paths for different religions. But all of them at the end of the day talk about helping people, being compassionate, being good, being honest. So that is something that will help you eat to your voice of conscience. This third point right now you know that I didn't know what to, what to write. So I brought in Ramayana Mahabharata insight. Yes, I didn't know what to write. There is still half a page to fill. Then having the courage of conviction and the burning desire to help fellow humans and build a genuine concern for society, environment and for nature itself. This courage of conviction also came from another question. In the same paper, this courage of conviction will be there at the top or somewhere or it will come in the bottom, ninth question or something. From the question itself, I made one point. Because somehow you have to manage an answer. These are points that you can use. These are general points you can fill anywhere. And put some English before and after so that there is a logical flow. Then believing in the collective nature of humanity. Because if you believe that we are all one, then you are not going to have greed. You will always listen to whatever that Manasachi or that voice of conscience keeps telling you. Don't go and harm other people. Be good. Be uh, right in your approach. All that. All the above can make one heed and listen to his purest voice of conscience. Which is a conclusion. Which is like your question got over. You answer this. Then you have to put in mathematics. You do this. No. Ends proved. Ends come approved. Same thing only. Okay. So now there is crisis of conscience. First was voice of conscience, now crisis of conscience. Which means you listen to your voice of conscience, now you are in a crisis, there is a dilemma. Whether to follow what your conscience is telling or to take care of your self benefit or personal benefit and all that. So it's the Kumunadi question, whatever I have told, the same thing only you will keep writing, but the logical progression of whatever we spoke in the last question. So this will leave. I want to talk about one quotation based question. We will find that. Ah, ah, quotation came. Ah. Okay, there is enough on this earth for everyone's need, but for no one's greed. Mahatma Gandhi. A very generic quote. For any quotation based questions, now, no one is asking you to be philosophical and bring all the psychological behavior and everything and write. Connect it to every topic in the syllabus. The first point I wrote, I am connecting greed to sustainable development. Yes. It refers to the concept of sustainable development in the modern context of human history. As present generations need, it is infringing upon the future generations rights over this planet. If we are greedy today, tomorrow our children will suffer. So Mahatma Gandhi is talking about greed only. So this I am connecting it to economics and sustainable development, you got one point. Now, so we are consuming 1.7 times the resource produced per year. Now this is a fact I remembered, so I have, I have added it. This fact I took from Pulse magazine. Uh, the monthly magazine I followed was Pulse only. Uh, the other uh, academies I tried, it didn't work out for me. Uh, it also refers to the need to build common brotherhood, tolerance and kindness for people of all caste, color, religion. This is greed of political power. When there is a greed of political power, you are going to communalize things. You are going to say, you two are different. I will make you fight. Then there is this divide and rule concept no, that the British used. So that concept comes in. So if you don't have that political greed, then you can write it like, uh, this common brotherhood tolerance and everything is needed. This is to ensure that politically also you are not very greedy for power. And nationality for collective prosperity of humankind instead of increasing economic inequality through oppressive social structures. So this last phrase, this last phrase, mm. instead of increasing through oppressive social structure. So the socio-political economic angle, I just mixed into one point. This will something that will keep happening once you start writing. Maybe I would suggest that you write maximum three to four ethics tests. Apart from that, you don't need, don't, don't spend too much time here because this you will do good. If you're scoring less, then write. But if you are scoring that 100 marks or something, then it's okay. If you feel that you are weak in something else, go prepare for that. Yes? 
So this is there. Uh, then Gandhi's word also means to inculcate a trusteeship mentality for business owners and share their profits and management with the workers instead of inappropriate hoarding of wealth. Socialism concept. There should be community ownership of the business. This I am linking to the trusteeship mentality of Gandhi. Because Gandhi spoke about cooperatives, no? That the worker and the management should always be in sync with each other and profit should be for the collective good. The business owners are are the uh, caretakers of uh, the society's uh, uh, values and uh, assets. That's how Gandhi spoke. So that's what I try to say here. It also refers to giving voice to the voiceless in our society and not hold power and authority for the greed of a single person, community, etc. Now that I am reading my own paper again, I see that the second point and fourth point are very similar. I am talking about for the greed of single person, community, etc. No, here, the greed of power. In second point also, I think I said the same thing. It refers to the need to build common brotherhood, tolerance, kindness, blah, blah, blah. Collective. Okay, okay. So, so the second point, I am telling there should be brotherhood, compassion and everything because we don't want oppressive social structure to eliminate economic inequality. This is the economic angle of it. The last point is the political angle of it. Yes? And then common prosperity is the future of humankind. This was my conclusion. Because we are talking about greed. One person's greed is another person's loss. So if there is collective uh, thinking or this common prosperity, then everyone is going to be happy. That is the future of humankind. The, this concept of futuristic conclusion. This is only futuristic conclusion. You don't need to break your head and get something fancy fancy to write here. Okay, I think I have taken 10 minutes. Uh, okay, we will we'll complete the class. I will share this paper with you. And maybe in some of the other classes that I will be taking, uh, I'll, I will explain some of these quotation based questions. Because quotation based questions is where I have seen aspirants struggle. You, you do not creatively think, so you do not know what to write there. Because you think philosophically, you think academically. We do not need that. We want you to connect it to the subjects you have read. Connected to society, connected to history, connected to your polity and governance, connected to agriculture, connected to science and tech. So you have eight, nine points to write. Yes? If any of you have any questions, we can talk. Otherwise, uh, this will be the end of our class. Thank you. I will be staying here for another uh, 30, 45 minutes. So if any of you want to ask me anything, we can sit and talk. Uh, so, for the online students who are watching the live, live relay of this, I am very sorry. Uh, for like, I will give you the numbers for asking your doubts. Please send your uh, doubts in this uh, WhatsApp for this number. Uh, 9600 999 9600999533.
so uh, so for the number uh, 6380394440 uh, yes i can speak on the mic you can also listen to the uh, doubts of the offline students who are asking here so that is all fine with me uh, so yes okay you can ask your questions with respect to material now uh, so these were the materials i used uh, if you have any specific questions to ask you can ask me at the end of this class the other questions daily answer rating ah see now this all start in the model exam that is so the first test i wrote was for for a one and a half hours exam so point is all of you have written a lot of exams in your life this is not the first exam you are writing all the hype and myth about this exam keep it aside this is just another exam correct ah itranal for 12th and board exam did you struggle writing an answer did you struggle passing your engineering or your bsc or msc or whatever graduation subjects you did did you struggle writing an answer there no you got some marks maybe you got like 70% or something topper vandu maybe you would have gotten 100% now the only thing you have to focus is okay in college maybe i did not study with utmost concentration so i scored only 70 now if i am being sincere i can also push to 100 that is only necessary matapadi for answer writing there is no new magic or there's no magic wand or some invisible land that will come and suddenly make you write something like a poet or author we are not writers we write for necessity so whatever you write is of you write here also you keep writing when you write like three four mock papers your writing style will change because of the time constraint so if you see my answer sheets i always start with the keyword ah all my points start with the keyword or start with the action word that is because that is the point you want to tell all that thing that all the english you put before that action word is anyway useless i am not getting marks for that so you will eliminate all of that and write just the action word or the keyword first and then continue complete correct ah that way it will get over like you have written some mock exams writing mock papers three you have written the approximate scores you have got so you didn't get the marks yet okay how much was it 48 this is for 125 marks test ah 250 ah this is okay so when you start writing for the first time after almost a year because the last time you would have written is maybe in third year of engineering or uh, i don't know how it works for a three year course the fourth year of engineering is when you don't have much papers to write and the writing speed the writing style all that would have been rusted so now first of you have to pick up the speed of uh, able uh, like being able to write 52 pages or writing 3500 words in 3 hours so that will come with practice don't worry if you are attending 14 questions in 3 hours right now it's okay from 14 people who prepared with me improved to 20 in my case i was i have never had a issue with uh, writing so adanal i used to write like 18 or 19 questions in my first few exams towards the uh, end of my like like the towards the Uh, the the final mains exam i was completing all 20 questions with 5 minutes buffer i told myself i will only take 175 minutes to write so that will eventually happen you need not worry you will complete the papers just focus it for whatever questions you write see that you are getting that 4 or 6 up less than 4 or 6 in 10 and 15 marks is a red flag something should be improved drastically getting above that be happy you may get some extra bonus marks so be happy and see that you can push it to good ranks there's one more question here i will answer this uh so first of all congrats thank you very much i'm not sure whether i'll clear prelims but i'm preparing for mains okay in case any of you are watching this and you are not sure of passing prelims and if you are aiming for the next attempt focus on where is the camera <laughs> okay uh, okay so uh, focus on getting your optional set it is very necessary for all of you to get your optional subject ready for mains before the prelim stage itself so your optional subject should be studied notes should be taken so that in 5 days you can revise your notes and go write the final exam it is very important because once your mains 3 days gets over you will be totally exhausted you will be physically exhausted you will not have the mental stamina to read or the physical strength to even sit i had fever on my third day of exam i am completing gs3 and i had one or two degrees fever i took 2 dollars 650 slept for 2 hours and then wrote my ethics paper because my body couldn't take the physical pressure of writing an exam for 3 days because we have never written 6 hours a day in the first place so that is something i will tell you focus on optional first 
once optional is completed in 3, three to 4 months then uh, focus on uh, the main topic of GS 1 to 3 that is for another 3 months uh, the main topics of uh, GS 1 to 4 that is for uh, uh, the social justice governance disaster management uh, internal security the science and tech and all those subjects you complete them so this would take 6 to 7 months of your time then go back to prelims again start reading everything for prelims so that this time you will crack prelims if any of you have problems with CSAT please please give it enough time so that you do not qualify GS1 and uh, do not qualify CSAT paper that is a, that is a blunder I, I am finding very difficult to accept because for the stakes that are there in this exam if you cannot qualify that qualifying paper after you pass GS1 uh, then it is it's wasted effort and wasted opportunity so that is the advice I would give you. Thank you. Ah, so you can ask your next question. Ah. Sim simple words are enough. My language looks a little complicated, no? You were asking it because of that. Ah, okay. So this language is not necessary, but eventually all of you will start writing like this. Because that is these are the words you keep reading again and again. If you keep reading it again and again, you will start using it. It is just honesty and integrity, I am just giving it one adjective on the side, ethical integrity. Ethics paper, ethical integrity It is just how you phrase your words. That is the questions I showed you are like that. Some of the other questions if you see, I would have also written paragraph by paragraph. It is like some questions once you read, those there are some I keep talking about those standard points, yeah. So when you have those standard points, you will start writing small, small points and writing more. When you do not have a standard point, then you will explain the one point that you have and the size perisa So that so when you write 20 questions, not all 20 questions will be like this. So one or two questions will be like that. I showed you some of the good questions. The questions I still remember writing. So, and the questions but then I can't check. In the paper itself, you see there will be some questions where I didn't know anything. Still, I don't know three marks. How about number of Yes, this is a very good question. In papers, if you see, there will be 13 or 14 lines only per paper or per page. I am not writing 150. I am not writing. I am not writing, see if I write 150 words per question, no, I was able to complete only 16 or 17 questions. So it was a very conscious decision I took that if I want to complete the paper, I have to reduce the number of words I am writing. And now think with the strategy I tell, told you, I am not aiming for the full marks of that question, I am aiming only for 4 mark. So, what is the is enough. Uh, so, what I have thought is in CBSE board exams or in the state board exams, there is always a key with which they correct. If they ask you to write this many words, there is a buffer of plus minus uh, 10, 20 words. You can go plus 25 or you can go minus 25. In essay paper also, in essay paper the word limit are very strict. If you write very less words then they start reducing marks. If you go above the word limit they will start reducing. But still they will keep a buffer of plus minus 25 words easily. In essay since it is a longer essay maybe keep it as plus minus 250 words, maybe for our questions keep it as plus minus 25. So that is the strategy I work with. So 125 words is what I was aiming for 10 marks, 225 for uh, 15 marks. There have been 20 marks or 15 mark questions where I wrote only 180 marks and still got 7 out of 15. Sometimes the point also matters, it is very subjective so uh, this 180 key getting 7 la rare, it is this is all exception, we will focus on the mainstream. And it is okay, reduce it to 125, reduce it to 225. Yes, just like your semester paper. You have to show some content on the paper and the content needs to have some quality. Uh, so semester papers or in your colleges, if they have given you percentages, there would be a slight difference between that 85 and 95 mark. It comes up because of very, very small minute changes. That same minute changes only, it is there for uh, this exam also. So if you understand how to score that 85 in your college, the same strategy will work in UPSC. You do not have to 
struggle too much. Don't think that I'm like making it very simple. Uh, it's it's an exam. Treat it as an exam. Take away that mental block you have, then you will also come to my way of thinking. This is strategy that other people have used. I have also heard it a lot of times. Uh, I told it whether I know the question or don't know the question, all 20 questions I will attempt. I will write something inside. See, because for a question, even if I don't know, I am writing something, logically one or two points at least will be there. I will get that one mark, two mark, that is bonus for me. If I don't write and go concentrate on some other question, and the four, five, I know. When it does not become five, what will I, like, it's, it's wasted effort. But I know instead of giving a zero, they can give me a one or two. That is easy marks to get. So that way I attended all 20 questions, in the same order they gave. That is essential for me because uh, uh, 10 mark questions you write less. So when I start writing, the first two, two questions I will I will be a little slow, points will not generate. Uh, and the warm up The warm up I was risking it out in 10 marks, small answers only. So even if I get 3 3 in the first two questions, my writing would have warmed up, then I will start writing more. If I risk it in 15 marks, instead of getting a 6, they give me 4, 4 in 2 questions, I am losing 4 marks. 4 marks, I can lose 2 marks and so I always start with 10 marks. Case study will come in the last 4 classes. Case study is by far the most easiest way to score marks in ethics. It is a template to follow. Uh, mostly Israel sir would be uh, taking that for in mains crash course. So that template will work everywhere. That it all comes from the dimensions of ethics we spoke of. That five, six approaches we saw. No, with that you will you will create options. They will ask, they will put you in a situation. You are so and so officer. You are handling so and so scheme. Some people are coming and requesting you for the scheme, but they are not eligible for the scheme. But they are very needy and poor, and they really need the support of the government. What will you do as an officer? Now you have to give situational, situational lama. So you will analyze the situation in four or five angles, give four or five options. With those four or five options, you will choose the most option, the most preferred or most ideal option you will choose. So how do you bring those five options into the problem? And the five options will come based on this uh, dimensions of ethics that we spoke of. You will give very radical options also. You will be like, the scheme is only for uh, uh, this segment of the population. These people are not eligible for the scheme. So I will ask them to go away. This also you can write as an option. You just won't choose this as your uh, final solution. But this is an option in front of you. Right? What, wh why would you write this option? You write it because you are a rule based bureaucracy. Rules says not to give those people. As an officer you are following your rules. That is the merit of the argument. The demerit of the argument, where is your compassion? Where is this desire to serve the people or help the people? That is being lost. No, The essence, the spirit of the service is being lost. You are being very rule based, book based. So that is how you analyze the argument itself. Yes. In the Mari uh, or ideas, give extremely negative option, then give a reasonably negative option, give some uh, some superman kind of option. Like I will do this also, I will do that also. Not possible. You can do only one thing. So option, then give one realistic option, and then give uh, four options are enough. Sometimes they ask you to write five, I always write four. So I will write these four. Then the most practical option is what I will choose. I will choose option number three because then you write some explanation. Case study is over. This is the template you will follow for case studies. So case studies is time consuming to write, but once you practice like 10 case studies, then it is very monotonous. In the, in the version paper, at some point I am like, what is this, first case study to third case study, I am writing the same thing, same keywords, same pros and cons, same uh, extreme option, uh, less extreme option, ideal option, practical option. Same story only in different different context. At some point, it became very monotonous, and I was happy that it was that way because I was sick. Purusha, I was sick. Sorry, I was sick. Sorry, my ethics score is what one or two. I think one or two. One or two is a is a average score, slightly above average because the topper is at one forty. Now that is a very extreme topper. The where the cluster of toppers existed one twenty to one twenty five. The next set of cluster is at 100 to 110. There are people at 80 to 90. So this will eventually happen because of the normalization. The Gaussian curve, they will fit you into a curve. Uh, 
if you are from say some of these uh, deemed universities or NITs, IITs and Anna University, then you will understand this curve thing. And I'm absolute grade. So relative grading they will fit you into a Gaussian curve. This curve la if you are in the in the uh, top 10 percent then you get a score. If you are in the middle ranges where most of the people would be, uh, other score could like at least mechanical engineering la there will be a curve like this. So you split it this way. This is your top 10 percent. This is your bottom 10 percent. This is where the majority is. This is the end of the day. This 20, this 20, this 40. 40, 80, 90, 100. So, the curve they will fit your marks. This is how all board exams are being conducted. They will fit your marks into this curve. Then, if you cross this threshold and come into the top 10, you will get certain marks. If you get stuck between this the next 20 percent threshold now you will get a certain marks range irukum adanal dhaan na solren ungalku and the and the extreme topper is at 140 the topper cluster is at 120 125 en sonna na so this line would be approximately 120 for this year it's all assumption nothing is concrete ipo na solradhu ellame assumption or at least that is why i have understood the marking scheme the next set of cluster 100 to 110 sonna la that would be the top 20 percent uh, and the 20 percent, the 100 to 110 level, the uh, second 20 percent level, all are coming. Sorry, another question. I will stop this. Clear, Peter. Thank you. Any other questions to ask? Sociology will talk. Ah, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, op sociology. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Hmm. Okay. That's <laughs> 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 Yeah. Okay.